Hello. All right, I think audio is working. My new audio setup has more reliance on the visual indication and less reliance on actually hearing the audio. Um, so let me know if anything seems uh, too quiet or poorly balanced. All looks good on my side, so why don't we dive in today? Let's start at the top. So, hello, happy Monday. Um, I'm Jules Altus. I am a real-life CFI, and the purpose of these lessons is to walk through the elements of uh, lessons that you would take on your way to get your private pilot's license. So this is the license you might get first if you're just learning to fly. So the lessons start from assuming you have no knowledge and we've been slowly building up to everything you would need to know to fly uh, on your own. There's a big caveat to all of that though, which is that the only way really to learn to fly in the real world is working one-on-one -on -one with a CFI. So working with your own CFI, they'll be able to point out areas where you're struggling and maybe need additional emphasis, uh, or they'll be able to point out areas where you're excelling and you spend less time on those things. And that kind of back and forth relationship is, is part of what makes a good, safe, proficient pilot. So with that in mind, the idea behind these uh, lessons is to just give some of the core content that would be in each of the lessons. Um, hopefully there's bits and pieces that are useful to you either in your sim flying or in your real world flying if you're already a pilot. Um, and I'm also trying to be attentive to folks who are just tuning in for periodic lessons here and there. So if this is your first time joining, um, welcome, totally fine. My goal is that you'll be able to learn something of use to you. Um, although of course, seeing each of the lessons and how they build on each other is the best way to, to pick up kind of more of the, the full set of skills. Speaking of being interested in flying, so if you are interested in flying in the real world, I would highly recommend going and finding a demo flight. Um, most uh, airports will have a CFI or a flight school or a flying club, and they'll be able to set you up with a demo flight to just get you out in the airplane, try out the controls, see if you like it. Um, that's how I started flying. That's how most of the people I know uh, also started flying. So it's a really great way to just uh, get a feel for if it's something that you'd actually like to, to spend more time on. Going through my notes here. Uh, the videos on Twitch, the older lessons are all, uh, for the most part, like the first I don't know, seven or eight or something like that, are all um, expired off of Twitch now. So they're all on YouTube for archives. If you want to reference any of those old lessons, they're up there. Uh, let me post actually that. And while I'm thinking about it, if you're watching this video after the fact, um, so here is the YouTube link. If you're watching this video after the fact and you have any questions that come up or feedback that you want to give, um, even if it's things like your audio levels were off in this video, that's still useful to know even, even long after because I can go and watch for it. Um, but any feedback after the fact is great to send into the Discord. So here is that Discord link. That's also a great little community if you want to just come hang out, talk about flying. Um, a bunch of great folks in the, in the Discord community there. All right. Uh, I think that's it for sort of, um, I was, th I always think of this as the administration section. It's sort of like the, here's the, the, you know, background info and the latest changes and any of that kind of stuff. Um, today I'm pretty much using the same setup that I had last time we flew. We won't do any VR today. Um, it's actually a ground only lesson. So if you're excited to get out and go flying, um, this one is not really about that. It's really about learning how to use navigation charts and how the national airspace system works. So all things that are super important uh, to be a pilot. Uh, and also I think will help with your ability to plan fun flights in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So if you're a sim-only pilot and you really only want to do the flying bits, um, I still think you'll pick up some really useful pieces of information and certainly resources you might not know about. Um, but the goal for today is really to cover kind of the key concepts and, and deep dive on those. Um, last thing I'll mention, since we're about five lessons out now from this pre-solo knowledge lesson, um, if you're curious what that's going to be, obviously we won't do a normal knowledge test um, in the same way because uh, we're not working one-on-one -on -one, uh, sort of student and instructor. 
Um, instead, we'll kind of talk about what a pre-solo knowledge test uh, includes. It's all in the FARs, so if you want to go look that up, you can also find it there. I'll talk about some of those topics that may be covered. And then also, if there are bits and pieces of information from past lessons uh, that I didn't think got enough emphasis or that I want to recover, then we'll, we'll go into those. Uh, maybe pick out some odds and ends questions, too. Uh, but more on that later. All right, I think that's all I have here. So why don't we jump into our lesson topics today? Okay, so here we are uh, on the, uh, what taxiway are we on here? We are on taxiway Tango of Palo Alto. And today we're gonna to talk about the navigation charts and national airspace system. Uh, the acronym the FAA uses is the NAS. I don't think I've ever seen someone use NAS instead of just saying like the local airspace, um, but I wanted to use the, the full name in case you want to go look this up. This is what the FAA calls it. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about airspace, especially in the Bay Area um, where I'm flying out of. So we're in Palo Alto near uh, SFO, San Francisco. Um, that's a, a big topic because we have a pretty busy um, really interesting airspace, uh, and I mean interesting in both my Minnesotan roots, interesting meaning uh, hard and not necessarily good, but also interesting in the sort of uh, interesting to aviation. It's kind of a cool case study on how airspace is set up and why and how to use it. What I was told when I was first starting as a uh, private pilot when I was about at the same stage in my training is if you can fly in the San Francisco airspace and if you can understand everything that's going on in that airspace um, in and around this, uh, then you'll be able to go anywhere in the country and fly just as well. And I have found that to be true. Having flown now in some major cities, um, I feel obviously it takes preparation and we'll talk about what it, all that involves, um, but I feel comfortable flying in those areas. All right, so our objective today is to develop pre-solo knowledge of required flight planning. Oh, um, well, let me, I'll read the whole objective and then I have a, a side note. Uh, pre-solo knowledge of required pre-flight planning, VFR navigation, charts, airspace, and weather minimums, weather briefings, and flight plans. So you'll notice that our uh, title for this lesson is Navigation Charts and National Airspace System, but then the objective specifically calls out pre-flight planning, uh, weather briefings, flight plans, all this sort of stuff. And as I was going through this lesson and compiling what I thought was going to be a good flow, it became apparent that really this would be a nice one to split into two lessons. And so although we're going to do it today as about a two-hour ground session, um, I think it'll take about two hours. We might go long, but I think two hours would be, would be just about right. Um, but I was realizing that it would be nice actually with a, a real student to split this into an hour long ground session on uh, pre-flight planning, weather briefings, flight plans, and then an hour long session on VFR navigation, airspace, charts, that sort of thing. So you'll see them sort of stuck together. I think the flow is still really nice, but I think it would be uh, more digestible to not have a two hour block of information. So uh, one nice thing with the video recording is if you wanna go back and replay something, obviously that's always an option. Um, so less concerned about the information overload here, but um, but you'll see a couple of my to-do notes in my lesson plan here is like, oh, maybe this should go somewhere else. So that's what that's about. A couple of references, actually several references here. AIM chapter three, that's all about airspace. Uh, this is a wonderful chapter in the AIM. The AIM itself is actually great overall, so it's a really good thing to, to read through. Um, but this airspace chapter, I think, does a really good job of covering everything uh, you need to know. Uh, PHAC chapter 12 is about weather theory, 13 is aviation weather services, 15 is airspace, and 16 is navigation. We will talk only briefly about weather theory today. We'll do a lot more on this when we get to cross-country planning. We'll also talk only briefly about navigation today. Again, we'll do a lot more of that in uh, pre-flight planning. Um, the reason these are in here is that the navigational charts that we use, there's some information that you can find in chapter 16 that's useful. So. Something to look for if you're looking to, to learn a bit more about those. This builds on the towered airport operations lesson that we did a little while ago. Um, so we're on lesson 12 now, that was lesson five. 
Uh, for those of you who actually attended this one, the towered airport operations at the time I had titled it as, um, I think I called it ground operations, light guns, maybe weather indicators and something else. It had sort of a long title and it was all about ground operations. Um, and after that, if you were there about halfway through, I went, this isn't really the right flow. Um, so I went back and revised it after the fact. And now it's about towered airport operations really focused on Palo Alto, where we're mostly flying out of. Um, but that's the, the title change, but also then the topic is a little different. We'll catch some of the things that changed in the pre-solo um, knowledge lesson. So if there's anything that was added to this after we did it, then uh, we'll cover it there. Like I said, two hours on the ground. All right, and we have, oh, there's my to-do. <laughs> Should uh, required pre-flight be part of the lesson. Um, so we've talked about, I don't think we've talked about PAVE yet, but technically we've talked about everything else here, but I don't feel like it was presented in a kind of cohesive, here's what it means to pre-flight for a flight and what we're thinking about. Um, so we'll cover a little bit more of this today and, and it'll make more sense, but, um, but I think in the future I might have this as a full lesson. All right, let me quick scan the chat, make sure there's no questions here. Looking good. Okay, I'm going to take a sip of my water and then we'll dive in. All right. So four things we're gonna to cover today. Required pre-flight action. This is the required pre-flight action by the Federal Aviation Regulation. So this is every single time, well, we'll read the specifics of what it says, um, but this is sort of the minimum of what you're required to do. We'll talk about the different charts that we often use. Uh, you may see these on Sky Vector if you've looked at Sky Vector before. Um, they're super useful for planning. They're super useful for understanding airspace. They're super useful for hazards. It's honestly some of my favorite maps I've ever seen are these uh, terminal and sectional charts. So we'll, we'll talk about all what's in there. Talk about chart supplements. We talked about these a little bit before, um, but it's really useful when we talk about airspace and especially what changes for certain airspaces. So we'll get into this a little bit uh, and talk about Palo Alto specifically. And then last, we'll finish with the national airspace system. So this is a discussion of what the different types or classes of airspace are, um, why they're that way, and how we think about using them, especially pre-solo. All right. First things first, required pre-flight action. So before I, well, I can leave this up. So you can see there's this acronym, um, KW Craft, uh, like Craft Mac and Cheese Craft. Uh, I'm sorry, NW Craft, Northwest Craft. Um, and so that's these items here. And uh, so no TAMs, weather reports and forecasts, known traffic delays, runway lengths, available alternatives, fuel requirements, takeoff and landing distance. So this is a nice little just um, memory device to remember all of these this definitely falls in the category of information that you could look up on the ground so when you're prioritizing what things to memorize there are some acronyms if you think about it you're going to want to be using uh, while you're flying in the air and you want to have them down so quickly and cleanly that you don't have to like rack your brain trying to remember what it is uh, the pre-flight action one doesn't fall in that category in that this is something that you are currently sitting at the airport on the ground. You could pull up the FAR if you wanted to and read through it again. Um, it's still a useful one to memorize, I think, because um, you'll find yourself kind of mentally checking through just, okay, did I look at all of these things for this flight? Um, but uh, as far as you know, mental bandwidth, that's something to consider. Okay, so we'll talk about each of these, but let's look at the actual FAR text here. So... I'm gonna go into my uh, FAR documents inside of ForeFlight, although you can also just Google these if you search FAR 91103. Actually, I have the link uh, in my own uh, notes here, but okay. So we go into, oops, not ForeFlight, but Federal Aviation Regulations and Part 91, and we are at Part 91105, we want 103. So this is in the subsection about flight rules. Um, a suggestion, I don't think I have it under, yeah. 
Uh, recommended homework is to start reading VFR related FARs in part 91. Um, that essentially, when I say that, I mean start from like uh, 91, 101. Um, and you uh, actually, you really want to start at the beginning of, the, of this section, part 91, because um, it's going to cover all of the general rules, which you should know, and then also the flight rules up through um, the end of VFR, which is uh, down at 161. So all good things to be reading through. Um, by the end of your training, you'll want to have covered all of the relevant FARs um, for your for private pilots. Um, we can talk more about what those are. There's also really helpful summary lists uh, in the beginning of the paper copy of the FAR AIM. I don't know if it's in this copy, but that's a really good reference point as well. Okay, so let's look at 103. Each pilot in command shall, before beginning a flight, become familiar with all available information concerning the, that flight. This information must include, okay, so this is a really key clause here. Become familiar with all available information concerning that flight. This is the sort of catch-all line, and you hear or you see this a lot in the FARs, which is like the first thing that gets said about a particular topic is kind of the broad statement about what their expectations are. And so although the FARs go on to list the specific things that you need, it would be, not only would it be irresponsible, which is one aspect to consider, but also it's um, technically against the regulations if you go out and fly and you don't know um, something relevant to the flight that isn't in this list. Um, I can't think of a super good example at the moment, um, but if I think of one through the lesson, I'll, I'll call it out. But essentially saying that like this is a good minimum list, but it's not everything you need to know for the flight. All right, part A here, for a flight under IFR or not in the vicinity of the airport, of an air, uh, not in the vicinity of an airport. So we are not flight under IFR. We're doing VFR, visual flight rules only for this. Um, if you go for your instrument rating, then it would apply to that. Um, or a flight not in the vicinity of the airport. Okay, so not in the vicinity of the airport. Um, one way to think about that would be leaving the traffic pattern is no longer in the vicinity of the airport. Uh, there's other definitions. I don't remember there being a specifically clean definition. I think it's uh, let me let me go and follow up on that to make sure. Um, before I commit to that, but my memory is that this is one of those um, a little bit more vague statements of what vicinity means. Um, but if essentially you can think of it as if you're leaving the traffic pattern. Um, and so that means most flights that we're doing. If you're really just going up, you're going to do a couple laps in the pattern, that's it. Um, you know, you by the regulations don't need to have that. Uh, however, you still have this top line regulation, which is before beginning a flight, become familiar with all available information. And so you could easily get some pushback to say, hey, even though you weren't leaving the vicinity of the airport, you still didn't become or you still didn't make yourself aware of all information concern, uh, concerning that flight. Uh, like if you didn't get certain weather information or if you didn't look up the NOTAMs for the airport, um, the notices to air missions. So anyway, okay. Uh, flights not in the vicinity of the airport, you need weather reports and forecasts, fuel requirements, alternatives available, any known traffic delays, uh, which you've been advised by ATC. Uh, for us, that doesn't usually come up because ATC doesn't typically advise us on those things. You need, for any flight, uh, runway lengths of airport intended use and takeoff and landing uh, distance. Uh, you need takeoff and landing distance uh, data. Okay, that's sort of, yep. And then Oh, okay, yeah, this is for the airplane flight manual. Sorry, I'm just double checking for this one. And uh, landing distance, yep. So essentially, you need to have the takeoff and landing distance from the AFM if your aircraft has one. So this is a specific manual that comes to your specific plane with the serial number of your plane on it. Otherwise, uh, some older aircraft won't have an AFM. And so then it has a, another clause here of where to get that information, which is just a, a reasonable source or reliable information appropriate to the aircraft. OK, um, so that was a lot of things all at once. and. Uh, you may remember that we already had an acronym for it, so we can leave our FARs behind here and instead look at our 
uh, Northwest Craft acronym. So I will uh, leave this up just because it's not too hard to do. Okay. So we already talked about all inf available information concerning that flight. So that's kind of the, the top line um, piece that you need to be thinking about. No TAMs, these are notices to air missions. Actually, this should be like this. So notices to air missions. Um, we'll talk about where to get these and what these are in just a moment. Uh, but essentially, these are pieces of information relevant to flying in certain airspaces or at certain um, airports. Um, Things like if a runway is closed or a taxiway is closed or if um, certain lighting systems are out or certain weather services aren't available, those would all be contained in NOTAMs. So there's sort of like information that you might normally find in a chart supplement. So that would be like for Palo Alto, we've seen this before. Information that might have been in here except that it's been uh, or it only started occurring or... Uh, or only became relevant recently enough that they wouldn't go and update the chart supplement. Um, so it's sort of that kind of information, um, but more more recent versions of it. Um, yeah, th there's other reasons they might publish NOTAMs beyond that, but that's a kind of a rough way to think about it. Um, and we'll look at a couple examples. It'll start to click. Weather reports and uh, uh, reports and forecasts. So you want to get a weather brief. There's three types of weather briefs, a standard brief, an abbreviated brief, and an outlook brief. Uh, we're actually gonna go through and get a standard brief today. So we'll, we'll look through this whole process and that would be your most complete kind of brief. This is something you'll obtain before you go flying uh, for any flight. And that's how you address that uh, weather reports and forecasts. That standard weather brief will also include NOTAMs if you select to, to show them. Um, and so, well, I'll show you how to, to pull that from there. Uh, there's this great website, 1-800-WXBrief.com. Uh, it's a free website uh, paid for by the government. So if you want to use it, you uh, definitely should. If you fly live weather in Microsoft Flight Sim and you want to start processing through what a weather briefing would look like, this is a great way to do it. Um, so you can pull up live weather in Microsoft Flight Sim and then uh, plug in where you're thinking to fly and kind of see what the, what the weather reports are for a, along that flight. Uh, you can also call 1-800-WEATHERBRIEF. I have a to-do here that it is a good idea as part of uh, private pilot training to actually call 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF, uh, WX brief, um, to see what that whole conversation looks like. I don't have this currently in a lesson plan, but I'm going to add it to either a future one for cross-country planning, probably, um, but I just put a little note in here to do that. A couple other weather reports and forecasts. METARS, this would also come with your standard weather brief. Um, this is the Meteorological Aerodrome aerodrome reports. Um, that's also has the ATIS, that um, automatic terminal information service uh, that we get. We'll say like we have information Bravo, we have information Echo or whatever it is. Um, that includes all the same information as the METAR um, plus some additional information about the airport. Um, so you've seen these already. If you've heard when I pull up the, the phone, we call the, the ATIS and we get that information. That's the same kind of information you get from a METAR. Uh, PIREPs, these are pilot reports. We talked a little bit about those. We'll look at what those look like. Uh, ATIS, Automatic Terminal Information Service, or the, so that's, you know, what we just talked about. You also may have, if there's no um, tower, you may instead have an AWOS or an ASOS. AWOS and ASOS are essentially automated services that will then broadcast uh, voice channels. So if we come up uh, tomorrow, we're going to be doing non-tower to airport operations. One of the things we'll do is we'll listen in on the uh, AWOS or ASOS to get what the latest weather is. And it's just a kind of automatic report. TAF, uh, terminal area forecasts, we'll get these included in our weather brief, but this is um, something that gets published by larger airports for uh, a... I should know this number right off the top of my head. Uh, I'm going to look this up before I say the wrong number, but for an area around the airport. So it's... Um, this is so um, funny because like a classic private pilot knowledge test question or a private pilot um, check ride question would be how large is the area that a TAF covers? 
um, and how frequently are they published? So uh, they're published every six hours and they cover 24 or sometimes 30 hour periods. Um, I'll actually show you what one looks like and then we'll see them again in the, the standard weather brief. But if I go into um, SFO, which is a large enough airport that it has a TAF. So here we go. And then we look under uh, Fourth Flight has this nice little tool for it. And you can see that there's all this uh, block of green text over on this side. And so at the t uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how to read this, but essentially it tells you the time that it was issued, the range of times that it's giving you for, and, um, and then what the weather is supposed to be like in each of those blocks of time. Uh, Fourth Flight has a nice kind of like breakdown of what that means in plain English. But um, anyway, when we do the, the full weather brief, we'll look at this a little bit more because I think um, we should point out the start and end times of that that forecast we can look at. And remember, everything in aviation is Zulu time. So all those times you see are going to be Zulu. Next piece for weather reports is airmets and sigmets. These are uh, airmen's meteorological information. Um, one note is that the FAA is making a uh, strong push to try and uh, make their nouns they use all gender neutral. Uh, I think that's really good. I, I think it's uh, kind of unfortunate how much of aviation's like old handbooks and stuff were written very uh, male centric. Um, one of the ones that has kind of a holdover and I'm not exactly sure what they're gonna do is airmen's meteorological information because they prefer aviators now. Um, uh, they'll probably keep airmet for the foreseeable future because it's a really well-known um, short version but it stands for airmen's meteorological information. Compare that with a SIGMET which is significant meteorological information. And essentially this would be a warning for an area about meteorological events that are going on um, that a general aviation pilot should be aware of. So that would be pilots like you and I. And then a SIGMET would be maybe for bigger aircraft uh, or uh, you know, for like large commercial operations where they wouldn't be necessarily as impacted by certain types of weather. But if it's a really big deal, then they'll also see it here. So for us as general aviation pilots, we care a lot about both airmets and SIGMETs. Um, knowing that SIGMETs are more significant sort of weather that we have to be aware of. And we'll look at all of these um, in the 1-800 weather brief in just a moment. If this just went like way over your head, don't worry about it. I know it's a lot of information. The good news is that all of this stuff is like we live and breathe it, learning to fly. And so um, we'll talk about it more even in this lesson, but then uh, this is stuff that comes up all the time. So, so that'll start to become more familiar. I guess I can leave that open. Next one is known traffic delays for general aviation, um, especially flying VFR. Unlikely that you're going to get any kind of information from ATC about a traffic delay to you. But um, sometimes, especially if they have certain types of operation going on, um, then you may get kind of uh, some, some sort of traffic delay info. You need to know runway lengths. We'll talk about how to find that. Um, or actually, we already did talk about how to find that, which is um, one place you can find it at least is in the chart supplement. And so this would tell you how long a given runway is. And you need to know those runway lengths for the airport you're going to, um, the airport that you're leaving from, as well as any alternates you're gonna use, um, which leads into the next point here. So uh, on our, right, so our Northwest craft, the A of craft is available are alternates. And so when we're looking at going flying, we also wanna make sure that we have an understanding of what alternate airports we could use in a given area. So let's go and hop on our actual map here. Um, and we can see that around the Bay Area, we actually have, so each of these little blue crosses and the, um, I'm gonna call it pink. I think it's magenta, and we'll probably see it on the chart legend, um, but I know that they have a specific color name for this. So um, forgive me for calling it pink for now. Um, but anyway, so we'll talk about what the difference between those different colors means. Um, it, towered and non-towered is essentially the difference. So this one is towered, this one is non-towered. Um, but we'll see that in the chart too. And so when we're talking about flying in the bay, you know, our practice area is really, uh, for the most part, it's going to be like maybe in here or maybe we'll be over here. Um, you know, sometimes depending on what we're doing, we might be over here, but uh, but typically we'll stay in this sort of area. We might go along the coast, and so depending on where we're going to be flying for the weather of that day, 
we want to be looking at what alternates we have in case, for instance, uh, something happens at Palo Alto where we can't go land there. Um, and so, or if we have some sort of emergency and we need to get to an airport more quickly, then we would want to go back to our home airport. Um, so like, let's say that we're doing uh, practicing things over here and something happens where we uh, want to get on the ground quick, we'd probably head to Livermore as our alternate because it's just right there and we can, we can get on the ground then. Um, we also have a restricted runway here. So in an emergency, you can use a restricted runway like that. Um, that's another sort of option, although maybe not the alternate that, that is meant by this. Uh, San Carlos is always another good option just up the road, especially if the Palo Alto winds are bad. Sometimes the San Carlos winds are better and vice versa. Um, so if you're a student pilot, you've been approved maybe to land in eight knot crosswinds and the wind at Palo Alto picks up more than expected, all of a sudden you have 10 knot crosswinds. Um, then you would want to look at your alternates and say, okay, what other airports are around? Listen to their ATIS and say, what are the crosswinds at each of those airports and can I land there? The, uh, another one uh, would be like if we're practicing out here, an alternate might be Half Moon Bay or um, it'd be kind of weird if we were this far down just for a practice area, but you know, there's airports all around. So for each of those airports that you're considering using as an alternate, you want to make sure you know the runway lengths, make sure that you can actually land there. Um, which we'll talk about in our last letter of craft. Um, so that's that's sort of what's meant by available alternates. Next one on here, seven is fuel requirements. So we're going to talk about the VFR fuel requirements momentarily, and then also look at how we calculate these in the POH. Um, there's an important topic for fuel burn that... So... Let me start this over because this is a really important topic and I want to make sure that I'm giving it the gravity it deserves. And actually the reason I have this to do in here is that I'm worried in the current lesson structure, I'm not giving it the right amount of gravity, uh, but I also don't want it to be like, this is a really important topic as you're getting to solo, but not necessarily like the first thing you need to learn. So I'm trying to find the right place for it. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about it today because that's where I currently have it. Um, but the reason that I want to highlight fuel burn specifically is when we're talking about flying an aircraft, what's giving us that forward thrust is the engine as it's developing power and the engine requires fuel in order to generate that power, right? And so if we ran out of fuel, we lose our engine, which means that we suddenly are flying a very uh, heavy aircraft without an engine. And the good news is that it works just like a glider. So if you lost your engine for some other reason, um, some other failure of, of whatever happened, uh, you can glide in and make a good landing um, and have a, a safe and reasonable outcome from that. Um, but it is really, really, really unfortunate to hear of pilots running out of fuel while they're flying because if you have some accident uh, in the air that was beyond your control, that's one thing. But running out of fuel just means that you weren't planning out your flight very well. Uh, one is you aren't complying with the FAR we're currently talking about, right? 91103. So that's one problem. Um, but beyond that, you're putting people on the ground's life in danger just because you didn't think about how much fuel you were going to consume while you were flying. Um, it's one of those things where if you read enough aviation blogs or enough aviation books, almost always in the first chapter, the author of the book makes some comment about how unbelievable it is that people run out of fuel um, on just like, you know, normal flying days. Uh, I mean, if you get delayed and there's a bunch of clouds and there's a whole other problem, things that you couldn't have foreseen, um, that's a different sort of problem. But, but just like hopping in an airplane, not checking how much fuel you have, getting up in the air and then running out of fuel um, is really, really problematic um, and, and really unacceptable, to be honest. So, okay, so that's why I wanted to make sure that it got uh, the proper amount of weight because we do this as part of our pre-flight planning um, because running out of fuel is such a silly reason to have an emergency um, and so avoidable. So to talk about fuel requirements then, we have uh, two kind of parts that we need to cover. One is the actual fuel burn. So how much fuel does the engine consume? And that's the one where I think I want to move that to a different lesson. So we'll talk about it here today, but I want to spend, I think, a little bit more time specifically on that topic. 
Um, and then the second piece is about the minimum fuel requirements from the uh, FARs to actually just go flying at all. So let's talk about the minimum fuel requirements first, and then we'll talk about how we calculate fuel burn. So that's how much uh, fuel we're going to burn per hour. So the FAR 91105 VFR fuel requirements. I will pop over to the actual FAR so we can look at them. So this is in our part 91 again. So it says no person may begin a flight in an aircraft under VFR conditions, which is mostly what we're flying here, or the only what we're flying here is VFR conditions, unless considering weather and wind forecast conditions, there's enough fuel to fly to the furthest or the first point of intended landing and assuming normal cruising speed during the day to fly at least 30 minutes after, at night to fly for at least 45 minutes. So a couple of things to unpack here. One is considering wind and forecast weather conditions, and what that means is that if you have a strong headwind, let's say that you're flying um, from here to LA, right? So you have um, a couple hours you're going to spend in the air. And if you have a strong headwind, it's going to slow you down a non-trivial amount. You're going to need more fuel because you're going to have to spend more time in the air with that engine running. And so when we're planning out our fuel requirements, we have to take into consideration the impact of wind on our flight. On the flip side, if you have a tailwind, you may um, plan on getting there sooner, but you have to be aware of the fact that the weather can change, uh, especially if there's uh, fronts moving through or something else that gives you an indication that uh, the weather may be unstable. So that's what it means by the considering wind and forecast weather conditions is it's, it's taking into account um, the actual flying time, not just sort of the theoretical um, you know, point A to point B distance, because we have to consider the the wind that we're going to be flying into. Um, to fly to the first point of intended landing, so this is if you're planning out a flight and you have multiple legs, um, it's pretty common that you would stop for fuel. Uh, a rule that I hear pretty frequently and I tend to like is to fly for three hours, uh, refuel, stretch your legs, get back on the plane, fly for another three hours, refuel, stretch your legs. Um, for each of those legs that you're going to do then, your first point of intended landing is where this rule applies to. So that would be your refueling stop. If you're flying during the day, you need to fly for it. Uh, you need to have enough fuel to get to the point of intending landing at normal cruising speed and then fly for at least 30 minutes more at normal cruising speed. We'll look up normal cruising speed here in fuel burn in just a second. Um, but if you're going to fly for at least 30 minutes more beyond that, that means Whatever your fuel burn is per hour, you need at least um, you know, a half hour's worth of fuel. So take your fuel burn per hour and divide by two. That would be your minimum additional fuel that you have to carry. So that's that VFR fuel requirements, that minimum fuel for VFR flight. If you're flying at night, which we'll do a little bit later in our lessons, um, then you need at least 45 minutes. So same basic setup of the rule, but you need 45 minutes. There's another clause here about rotor crafts. This would be like helicopters, so that's not us. I will say my own personal minimums are one hour, day or night. I want an hour of extra fuel to figure out if there's clouds or if there's something else going on. Um, the safety margin for me, having extra fuel in the tank to figure out what I'm going to do if an, I ex encounter something unexpected is priceless, right? I would rather need to stop more frequently along my flight and know that every single time I go up flying, I have an extra hour of fuel in the tank. Um, and so that's my own personal minimum. Um, for each pilot, you get to decide your own personal minimums and talking with a CFI about how you set those minimums is a really good idea. Kind of uh, discuss back and forth about some of the pros and cons. Uh, but for me, it's an hour. Also for the club that I fly in, it's an hour minimum. So kind of aligns nicely there, but day or night, they expect an hour of extra fuel in the plane when you land. Um, I think that's it. I've heard more conservative approaches to fuel before too. I think, um, I don't think you can get too conservative. There's of course a kind of practical limit where like you're never going to get anywhere. Um, but uh, I think 30 minutes that the FAA requires is pretty, pretty few options. I mean, by the time you've realized that you need to go somewhere else and then addressed everything else, you're already starting to burn into your fuel reserves pretty quickly. I'll see a post in the chat. I'm just going to read that real quick.
Yeah, shoots. I think that's right. I think um, uh, mistake for new pilot. So shoots is saying that a mistake for new pilot would be to plan the fuel correctly for cruise speed, but then forget about the wind uh, or forget if they're flying at higher than cruise speeds. Um, and I would add to that, yeah, uh, flying too fast. I would add to that also if your mixture control, uh, if you haven't been correctly doing uh, mixture. And we'll talk more about that. Ooh, there's a really good one actually for this fuel burn discussion. Um, let me make a note of that. We have been flying below 3,000 feet um, for every flight we've done so far. Just the, oh, you know what? That's not true. We did, um, well, okay. So we've been maneuvering for every flight we've been doing so far. And so we've been using mixture rich. Um, there is a really good case to be made that especially early in your flying, you want to get in the habit of setting your mixture correctly for the, the altitude you're flying at. Um, and we haven't talked about this at all. Um, I'm just processing through if that's something we should actually get into today. And I don't think it is, but this is definitely something we need to talk about. Um, and actually something I think, I think that I'd want to have in a much earlier lesson, um, potentially. So the way that my instructor taught it to me and, and I thought worked pretty well, although, um, there's some pros and cons with this method, but essentially, and I was doing, I was first learning the four fundamentals and we would climb from 2,500 to 3,500. And as soon as we would level off at 3,500, we're then above 3,000. And so we would lean the mixture for that new altitude. But then as soon as you go low 3,000, you bring your mixture full risk uh, below 3,000. So that's all according to the POH. Um, this is a good topic that we should spend a little bit more time on, but that was how I learned it was during the four fundamentals of flight. That was our, like, what, second lesson or something. Um, and I think that was good, uh, but, um, but I want to reflect on if that's the way that I want to teach it and the way that I think will fit best into the flow. So anyway... Um, but yeah, shoots, great point. Um, getting the mixture wrong. Yeah, 5,000 for spins was used. Exactly, yeah. So so shoots, and and uh, shoots is bringing a really good point with the 5,000 too, is like, um, uh, let's do a super quick sidebar on this and, and I'll pull this into, actually, let me make a note. Um, okay. So we'll do a, we'll make sure that this is in a uh, upcoming lesson in more detail, but just to, to quickly touch on the mixture control. So you have these two knobs inside the aircraft. Pop in here. Yeah, shoots, I totally agree. I totally agree. It's sort of like, I mean, one place we could really talk about it because we're going to have a lesson on... Um, on emergency procedures and that also includes systems of the aircraft and so talking about it then would make a lot of sense but i feel like it's going to be kind of overloading to talk about the engine and mixture while also talking about you know here's the emergencies that you want to be ready for um, so let me think about the best place to put that but i i totally agree it's it's a whole topic on itself um, anyway so the throttle which is mostly what we've been using for power control uh, only what we've been using for power control um, uh, in this aircraft. And then there's this red one, which we, we talk about when we lean for taxi. So we went through the procedure of how do you decide how far back to pull it um, when you're taxiing around. And the reason we do that is that we don't want to be, um, uh, we don't want to be burning a ton of fuel on the ground during taxi, not just for the rate of fuel burn, but also because you can get carbon buildup inside of the engines and on the spark plugs. And so that'll make it uh, the engine run more poorly. That's actually one of the things that we're looking for in the magneto um, check. So during the run up, we do our, our mag check where we go left and we look for a drop of RPM and then right and look for a drop of RPM. And partially what we're looking for is are the spark plugs all firing um, the correct amount, but then also are they each firing uh, like the right magnetos and the left magnetos are the spark plugs connected to those also firing equally. Because if, for instance, one of the spark plugs had a really big carbon buildup on it, 
that would cause the difference between the RPM drops to be significant. And so if it's really significant, you know, you have a problem because there's an imbalance. So that's the reasoning behind what we're checking for. Um, but we, so we set this back for taxi. We've been doing that as we taxi around and then we bring it in for takeoff. We want mixture rich at this altitude. Um, and I say at this altitude because what mixture is essentially doing is it's changing the ratio of fuel to air that goes into the engine. And we need to have that control in the cockpit because uh, as you know, if we get, or as we already talked about, if you get higher up in the atmosphere, the air is less dense. And with less dense air, that means the weight of the air and the weight of the fuel, I'm sorry, the weight of the air is decreasing. But if we didn't have this knob, the weight of the fuel would stay the same. And so all of a sudden we have on the surface, we have this great ratio that works well for developing uh, power in the engine, this kind of preset ratio when the mixture's all the way in, um, that works really well. But if we get up to altitude, now we have way more fuel to that ratio than we do to the air. And so we actually need to lean our fuel, essentially put in uh, less fuel uh, like at any given time so that the ratio with the outside air density stays the same. Because we want that ratio to always be correct. And we do that by then bringing the mixture back. We'll spend more time on this in a future lesson um, because this is a, a nice topic that I can get some good video explanations and stuff. So if this is totally not clicking, don't worry about it just for the moment. Um, but just to close out what, uh, what Schutz was saying is like at 5,000 feet when we're doing spins at that altitude, really if we're doing anything at that altitude, if you have your mixture full rich, the ratio of fuel to air is going to be so off that the, the engine will not develop very much power. And so if you don't lean the mixture, not only are you risking carbon buildup, but also you're not getting that much performance from your engine and you're just burning fuel. Okay, so that takes us back to the uh, original conversation then about fuel requirements, which is um, we know that we need to have enough fuel to fly for at least 30 minutes after our uh, destination. So including the wind for the flight that we're doing. Um, so then how do we find out how much fuel we actually burn? As you might expect, the answer is in the POH. So if we go in here, we can look under our aircraft performance. This is the same section that we had looked at previously for um, takeoff performance. And you can see that we have fuel or time, fuel, and distance to climb. And so this will tell us if you want to climb up to a certain altitude. So let's say that we're climbing to 5,000 feet pressure altitude. To do that, we're going to have to use 1.9 gallons of fuel. It also tells us that it's going to take us 10 miles to do that and uh, eight minutes to do that. So the other thing they mentioned on here is that you want to add 1.4 gallons of fuel for your start, takeoff, and taxi allowance. Uh, and that mixture needs to be leaned above 3,000 feet for maximum RPM. So that was the, the piece that uh, Schutz and I were talking about is that the forgetting to lean the mixture means that you're just burning a ton of fuel and then your fuel calculations will be off. And you increase all of these by 10% for each 10 degrees above standard temperature. And then distances shown are based on zero wind. So that's important too, because if there's a strong headwind, then your distance is gonna be off. Okay, so that's one of the time fuel distance to climb things. So in order to figure out how much fuel we're gonna burn, we look at this chart and that'll tell us how far uh, like how much fuel we will have burned in climbing up to our destination altitude. If we go, um, and I'll mention, I'm mentioning this now because this is required before we go flying. When we do our cross country planning, we're going to go through a, a planning exercise that uses all of these in a lot more detail. Um, so, okay. Cruise performance. So this is the other aspect of things. So if we're going to be cruising at, let's say we're cruising at 4,000 feet pressure altitude and we're running the engine at, uh, 2,550, say, and we get to choose what RPM we want, although we can talk about how we pick that. And it's a standard temperature day. So uh, remember at 4,000 feet, our standard temperature is, well, our standard temperature at uh, zero at um, sea level is 15 degrees Celsius. And we lose two degrees Celsius for every thousand feet we climb. And so times uh, every thousand, so 
I'll do per thousand. Um, okay, so if we're flying at 4,000, that means that it's 15 degrees Celsius minus 8 degrees Celsius. That's 2 times 4 for the 4,000. And so that means that our outside air temperature would be 7 degrees Celsius. Um, okay, so how do we know what the outside air temperature is at the altitude we're going to be cruising? That comes up as part of our pre-weather briefing or our, our standard briefing. Um, so we'll find that when we go and get our weather reports, we'll be able to do that. But just for the sake of quickly how to read these charts. Um, uh, so we would choose our particular power setting. Um, so let's go 2,550. And that's going to give us then 117 knots. And gallons per hour, we're going to burn uh, just shy of 10 gallons per hour. And so... Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to cover on here. There's a couple more charts that'll give you sort of like your range you can fly in certain configurations and endurance and things. We'll talk more about that again um, when we get to our cross-country planning. What I want to show for this though is, let's say that we're starting at sea level and we're going to fly up to 4,000 feet where we're going to do our maneuvering today. So we know that's going to take two gallons, less than two gallons, two gallons. Um, I'm gonna do this rounding up so that we get an upper estimate on what our fuel requirements are. For your check ride, you definitely wanna do it very precisely. So you should use the POH as best you can and you want to correctly interpolate between the numbers. Um, so I'm doing upper bounds because that gives us like, uh, in the worst case, sort of overestimates on this, um, but that's not good enough for the check ride. So, and it's also not good enough for our cross country planning when we do it. So, we'll we'll come back to this. Don't worry. Uh, but anyway, so we know from sea level, we use zero gallons at sea level. So two minus zero is two gallons. If we had started from like two thousand feet, maybe the high, air, airport's at a higher elevation, we would subtract off whatever the fuel for that was. Uh, but we're at sea level, so we're going to use two gallons to climb here. And then we need another 1.4 gallons, so we can say two gallons uh, for our start, taxi, and uh, takeoff allowance. So that's two gallons for getting everything set up, two gallons to get out flying, and up to 4,000. And then uh, for flying around, then we'll be flying at, uh, let's say we'll be mostly at 2,000 feet uh, practicing maneuvers, for instance. Um, so if we're at 2,000 feet and we're going to be operating at 2,400 is what we had been setting for our RPM during maneuvering, and let's say it's a standard temperature day, then we know that we're going to be burning 9 gallons per hour. I would typically round this up to 10 because I'd rather have a little bit of extra fuel in the tank, but um, you know, when you're calculating the precise, then you'd use 9 here or interpolate between to get the, the exact thing you need. Okay, so then we have, we know we need four gallons of fuel to get going and fly up. We know we need, uh, really it should be, um, since I said that we're doing maneuvering at 2,000, we'd use the 2,000 one, but um, we'll keep with that one. So uh, four gallons then total for this. And uh, 10 times the number of hours that we're gonna be flying at that airspeed and at that altitude. So. If we're gonna go out for a two hour flight for a lesson, then we need uh, times two is 20 gallons. And then we need plus the four gallons that we had in our original planning is 24 gallons. Uh, and I'm gonna actually do it like this. Okay, so writing this out. Oops, uh, start up. <laughs>
All right, so the reason I wanted to write it out like this is so that we can make sure that we're correctly accounting for our fuel reserve. So we need fuel reserve. Uh, this is a daytime flight, so our minimum is 30 minutes. Again, my personal minimum is an hour, so when I do these calculations, I add an hour to it. Uh, but we'll do it to the FARs for the discussion today. Um, So we use our cruise speed, which we went and found in the chart, times um, 30 minutes, which is one half hour. And so that gives us five gallons. And so we have two gallons plus two gallons plus 20 gallons plus five gallons equals 29 gallons. Okay, so. Let's hop in the plane quick. So this is for us going up to do practice maneuvers. I'm overestimating in a couple of places. Uh, one, actually, I don't, I don't like that I'm doing it this way. So we're going to go climb to 2,000 instead because um, we're, we're cruising at 2,000. So it'd be a climb up to where you're going to cruise and cruise. Maneuvering is a little bit different. I tend to overestimate on maneuvering just because um, in actuality, you're probably burning less fuel because you're likely running the engine. Like if you're doing slow flight, you're running the engine slower, you're burning less fuel. Um, but uh, but I tend to plan it as though I'm just running the engine at cruise speeds uh, the whole time. Um, so let's go, oops. I want to get my um, fuel to climb. Okay, so let's say that we're climbing up to uh, 2,000. So we're going to use 0.8 gallons of fuel from sea level, um, which would be one gallon here. So let's go to our thing again. And so that's there's our one gallon. So um, pardon my, there must be some way to erase. I'm sure of it. But, um, but anyway, so this will be one gallon. And so that means we need 28 gallons. Okay, so... We talked about this when we first started flying, but what I want to do now is let's go in the airplane in Microsoft Flight Sim and see if we have the right amount of fuel for the flight that we're talking about doing. We hop over to the aircraft. We do have fuel gauges in here, but it is a good instinct to not trust the fuel gauges with something so important as how much fuel you have. And so you should either visually confirm it, um, either that the fuel tanks are full, you can see it, the fuel all the way to the top, or um, inside of the uh, tank, there's actually a neckline on it, and filled up to the top or to the bottom of the neckline is another uh, fuel amount. And that's all marked inside of the, uh, uh, the POH information here. Let me show you where that is. Uh, oh, I've got to switch back here. Um, I can do it that way. Hey, look at that. Okay, so I'm in the limitation section. So this near fuel tank uh, filler cap, so that's this red thing that we're seeing on the airplane. Next to that, there's actually a printed label that says what's written here. Legally, there has to be, otherwise the plane's not airworthy. Um, so the sim doesn't have that. That's it's not, I mean, you couldn't fly this plane um, in the real world. So just a note on limitations and the requirements there. Um, but you'll notice that it says the capacity is 26.5 usable gallons. If it was filled to the filler indicator tab, that would mean you had 17.5 gallons. So if you had filler indicator tab on the right side and to the filler indicator tab, the bottom of the neck on the left side, so on both sides, 17.5 times two means you have 35 gallons usable fuel. So if you're... Um, coming to Palo Alto, you're going to do a lesson. Typically, we fill up our tanks to the neck because that gives us 35 gallons of fuel. We just did our fuel requirements for a kind of typical lesson. And so for a typical lesson, we only need 28 gallons of fuel. Um, again, the club requires a minimum not 30, but an hour. So we'd require uh, 33 gallons of fuel. And so 35 gallons of fuel is perfect. Um, if you were going to go out for either a longer flight um, for whatever that lesson is, or if there's different changes, uh, specifically odd weather going on, like if it's really cold or other things that might 
change some of the fuel burns, then you might go and do that. Uh, you, you may, but anyway, the, the, the important takeaway being that every time you go out and fly, you need to know how much fuel you're going to use and you need to know how much fuel you have. And you don't want to just trust the fuel indicators. You want to go and actually look. Um, the last way you can do that is you'll get a little um, uh, fuel, uh, they don't call it a dipstick, they call it a, it essentially looks like a straw and um, along it are these markings. And so you stick this, what is essentially a long straw into the tank, plug the top with your thumb and when you lift it out, it'll show you the fuel level in the tank. And that will give you a more precise reading on how much fuel is in there. So if it's not filled to the neck, it's not filled to the top, then you need to know how much you actually have. And so you'd use that um, the little measurement um, straw. I let me let me look up what the name of that is after the after the lesson. Um, measurement straw. I'm gonna kick myself later for not remembering it, but that's okay. A fuel thief. Oh shoot! Sent a couple. Okay, let me read your messages. Shoots at Shanley. Yeah. As well as, the, as well as the pump fakes, yeah. Yep, yep. So Schutz is saying that um, the airport he grew up, they'd have calibrated sticks per aircraft. That's also been my experience. Um, for really standard aircraft, like the 172 we have here, you can buy ones that are um, already calibrated for it. But, um, but having, there's a couple of different ways you can do it just to make sure you get a clean measurement. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I, I don't think I've ever been in a plane that didn't have, I mean, you need to have some way to measure the amount of fuel in there. And I've seen one other thing that wasn't like that kind of uh, stick or straw approach. Um, and it was for the DA-40 and it was, it's sort of a, a pain, but it's uh, just another way to measure the fuel. Uh, shoots, yep, shoots is saying, I was tr told to never trust the fuel gauges. 100% agree with that. Never trust the fuel gauges. Um, they are legally required to be accurate. However, it is one of those areas of the aircraft that has been known to be wrong and been known to be wrong at times when you really wish it wasn't. Um, so although, yes, they are supposed to read accurately, no, I still wouldn't trust them. Um, I would rather know my fuel burn and know how much fuel I have. Uh, a, th a fuel thief. Okay, that's the 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 little measurement straw thing I was calling it. That's the fuel thief. Huh. You know, I never thought about it, but I guess it is the exact same thing you use in brewing. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you. Also, shout out to your report. Nice. Uh, okay. So, how are we doing on time? We got about an hour left. We're probably on track. We have some some uh, kind of a, a whole topic change coming up here. but um, Okay, so we talked a little bit about fuel requirements. So let's say we went and measured this, and just for the sake of looking at it, let's say that it came up exactly the same as what the fuel uh, tanks told us was in there. So the reason I'm doing it this way is we can't actually measure in Microsoft Flight Sim, so we're just going to look at the um, uh, fuel gauges that should tell us how much are in there. Um, and although I would never do this in real life for the sake of Microsoft Flight Sim, we'll just say that those are the correct fuel levels. So the Cessna 172 is uh, the fuel gauges are measured electronically, which means that we need to have the battery on in order to get a fuel level. Okay, so we see that we are right between 10 and 15, so that's probably 12.5. So we have 25 gallons of fuel. So then the question is, can we go off to do this flight that we just planned based on the, the minimum fuel requirements. So we have 25 gallons of fuel, and our minimum we said that we needed to do this flight was 28 gallons of fuel. So we cannot leave with the amount of fuel we currently have for this flight that we're talking about doing. An important thing to call out though is we actually have enough fuel without our reserve to make the flight. So if you forgot about your VFR fuel minimums, you might be like, oh yeah, I got just enough and then I'm going to coast into the air airport and my engine will quit right on final, um, which obviously is a, a horrible idea. Um, and so the reason that I wanted to use this specific example is 
when we think about fuel, we have to take into account the FAA minimum fuel reserves, also our own personal minimum reserves, uh, and then we make an assessment about how much fuel we're going to need compared to how much we actually have. So uh, looking at this flight, then we would need to call up the fuel truck and get some more fuel, which we could actually talk about how to do that. Every airport's a little bit different, um, but the club that I'm a part of here, you can, they just have a cell phone number you can text or call. Um, a lot of places are self-service, so um, that's actually a really good tip for anyone studying your private pilot. You should, in the course of your training, fill up at a uh, self-serve fuel pump at least once. You want to do that. Um, you can figure it out on your own if you were like in a pinch, um, but it would be really nice to have an instructor be able to like kind of point you to the, the couple weird things. Um, so, okay, great. So I think we uh, sufficiently um, uh, dove into the fuel requirements piece of this. So remember, we're still talking about our pre-flight requirements. We have this Northwest Craft uh, KW or NWKRAFT. Talked about F is that fuel requirements. Um, we need to look up our fuel burn. We need to compare that to the VFR minimum fuel requirements, which change for the day and the night. Um, this, the fuel requirements, because it's such an important topic and because getting it wrong is so potentially problematic, is going to come up on your check ride. So uh, if you're going to go for your uh, private pilot check ride or really any certificate level check ride, they're going to ask you to do some amount of cross-country planning and included in that cross-country planning is going to have some discussion of fuel and that discussion of fuel is going to branch out into a couple of other topics. Takeoff and landing distance is the last piece here. So we actually did this when we talked about our takeoff and landing, so I won't spend much more time on it here, um, but you do need to know, right, we have our runway lengths, especially we have all our runway lengths for our alternate, uh, alternate, <laughs> alternate airports that we potentially could use. Um, and all that information for how long you need is in the POH. So we won't rehash this because we already did this once. Um, but before you go flying and before you do your cross-country planning, this is also something you need to make sure you have a sufficient buffer on. Uh, and reminder, just like with the fuel requirements, how I have my own personal minimums that I hold to that are above and beyond what's required by the FARs, um, just for what I think is a more safe envelope that I'd like for flying. Um, I have that same sort of thing with my uh, takeoff and landing distances. So you remember, if you were there for that lesson, that I mentioned I use 150% of the total feet to clear 50-foot objects um, as my personal minimum to do a landing there. So I don't want to land. Like, if I have to hit exactly the POH best performance landing number, that's not the situation I want to set myself up for. I'd rather have that extra 50% margin on it. That's a decision that uh, we talk more about when you get to uh, personal minimums, but something that I'll put a, a note on real quick because it's an important thing to think about. The other thing, uh, just a reminder, high, hot, and heavy, those are your three red flags for takeoff and landing. So if you find yourself at a high elevation airport, it's a hot day, and you have a fully loaded aircraft, that should be raising alarm bells that your aircraft performance um, may suffer and it may suffer more than you expect. So uh, obviously we uh, need to know our takeoff and landing performance and we do that before we go for any flight. Um, when you're, maybe you're spending the weekend in the mountains and you're supposed to leave Sunday morning when it's cooler and then a couple hours go by and you're running late and all of a sudden it's much hotter out, that's the kind of, you know, stop, think about what the high, hot and heavy circumstances are and make sure that you've done the aircraft performance calculations to make sure that you can climb out okay. Um, you don't want to end up in a situation where either you don't have enough runway or you can't climb to clear obstacles. Um, it could be really, really dangerous. Okay, 12.09. Um, let's do this. So I said that we we're going to call and get a weather uh, report and forecast. I think instead, let's do that tomorrow, unless we end up with time today, because um, this is going to be a bit of a deep dive. We've already kind of done one big deep dive today, and we have another one yet coming up with the charts. Um, and uh, and this is a really good one. We can we can uh, tack on to 
not even tack on, honestly, it, it fits really well into um, non-towered airport operations because this is part of how we uh, plan out going to a non-towered airport. So, uh, okay, so if we have time today, we'll come back to other reports, but let's plan to move on to uh, the navigation charts and the national airspace system. So I will pause here just for a moment. Let uh, folks, if anyone has any questions, take a drink of my water. Periodically, I look over at my um, two-year-old, uh, well, not really a puppy anymore, but his two-year-old dog is uh, asleep just to my right. And so I'll look over and see where he's at during the lesson. Um, and it's pretty funny because he always starts sort of like looking right up at me at the beginning of the lesson. And then he kind of goes into this like curled up in a ball. And then by the end, he's just like totally laid on his side. <laughs> so uh, increasingly lulling him to sleep. Maybe it's for the best. Uh, okay. Let's keep going then. So we're going to talk about today terminal charts and sectional charts. When we do cross-country planning, we'll flip our terminal chart over and look at the backside. If you have a terminal chart, uh, you can do that. And you can check out the um, uh, suggested routes for getting around the terminal airspace. But uh, today, we don't need to spend uh, time on that. Uh, the sectional chart is the most common one that you'll hear. Um, this is the... I'm sorry, let me take a step back and talk about charts in general. So when I talk about charts, what I mean is this. So the entire US has been charted out with every single airport that you might want to use, information about all those airports, navigational aids, um, airways. It'll have some roads. It'll have uh, information about uh, mountains or other kinds of obstacles. It'll have water. Tons and tons of information included in the sectional charts and the terminal charts. And there's also a world chart, which is kind of cool, um, that is published by the FAA. And all of this is available in a couple of different formats. One you can get it is if you just go to the FAA website, you could download these enormous PDFs. Would not recommend that. I tried to load one up yesterday and it took like, I don't know, 10 minutes of just waiting for it to load. Um, a better way to do it is to go on what's called skyvector.com. So if you want to just um, check out Skyvector as kind of to peruse around a particular area, you'll see essentially the same thing that you're seeing on my iPad now. Um, but uh, you don't have to use ForeFlight or anything fancy. It's just a, a really nice website. And it's great for student pilots um, when you're first just getting introduced to this because you can look all over the country and check out things everywhere. Um, Shoots, are you comfortable with me loading up that airport as an example for today? And totally fine if not, um, but since you mentioned it, it's kind of fun. Uh, and I've, I haven't looked at it before, so it might be kind of interesting to, to see how I, how I reason through it. Okay, cool. Sounds good. Um, I may or may not do that. We'll, we'll see how the next bit goes. Uh, okay, so uh, terminal charts and sectional charts. So sectional charts are these larger areas, um, and I'll show you that would be the size of one sectional chart. So it's like much of Northern California, for instance. Um, or if we go down, pick one maybe in the center of the country. So if we go for this one, there's another one. So like that, you can see kind of the, the top boundaries are really, really thin, but you can see kind of the outline of the white. That's the size of a sectional chart. So it's like really pretty big chunks of the country covered by a sectional chart. The scale is one to 500,000. And there's a conversion that you can find that goes from the uh, number of inches to the number of nautical miles. So if you're taking this um, and you grab a ruler, you can actually measure this out and say, okay, so the distance between you know this um, peak and that town is whatever distance, and you can compare it to your, your chart here. Um, my ForeFlight has a feature where you can actually, um, oops, now I'm on a different sectional. Um, but my four flight has a feature where I can use two fingers and drag it and it matches the same thing, which is sort of what you'd expect. Oh, interesting. We'll retain VOR. So it's not part of the minimum operational network, but it's going to keep its VOR. That's... Or, or, or it is an FAA emergency airport. 
Um, that might show up actually. We'll, we'll have to look at that. Um, that's a cool example if so. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, probably in emergency cross-country navigation conversations. Um, but essentially, well, it would be part of the minimum. Yeah, good for later discussion and right. Yeah, navigators. Yep, very cool. Yeah, it's interesting to me which ones. So we'll talk more about this later, but there's a subset of the um, airports around the country that the FAA has designated for this minimum operational network. Essentially, they're going to maintain older forms of navigational aids at those airports in case of emergency. Um, and there's a bunch of criteria they use to decide which ones keep their nav aids and which ones don't. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So that's pretty cool. We'll see if it's charted. I, I don't think it shows up on the VFR charts. Um, okay, so a uh, sectional chart is this one to 500,000 scale. The reason I call it the scales is that the terminal chart is uh, half that. So the terminal chart essentially shows where the sectional charts are these this big, a terminal chart would be the area around a class Bravo airspace. Um, let's see if I can get one loaded up here. So there's the terminal. I think it's gonna go away if I zoom out, yeah. Oh, you can kind of see the outline though. So if you notice on here, there's that, um, that white box. It's kind of faint to see, but that's the outline of where that terminal area chart is, that tack. And so compare that to the sectional for the whole area. So there's the entire sectional is that big, the terminal area chart is that big. So because the actual paper itself, when you go and buy a physical one, um, is about the same size though. And so it just means that this terminal area chart has more granularity and better details about that terminal area. Um, there are four uh, kind of more complex class Bravo airspaces. So you can see that kind of white box here. So there's a terminal area chart for, uh, what city is this? Phoenix. Um, you can see them all over the country, right? All these white boxes. Um, so if we go back to SFO, I'll show you the difference between these two. So this is what the uh, terminal area chart looks like. And if I tap my screen, it switches to the sectional chart. So it's just that like, it contains a lot of the same information, but it's not quite so cluttered. And so it's easier to use for planning purposes, especially when we do cross country planning, we'll use our terminal area chart and then we'll switch over to a sectional chart once we leave the terminal area. Okay, terminal and sectional charts, a lot of the symbology is the same. So let's start talking about what's actually on these charts. I'll give the disclaimer that I'm uh, kind of a map nerd. I got that from my mother, I found out. Um, so yeah, I, I love this kind of stuff. So <laughs> pardon me while I kind of geek out a little bit. Um, I loaded up this VFR chart legend. It's actually a, a legend from ForeFlight, although the same thing is available. Um, you could search it online, or if you pull up the sectional chart, um, the legend is up in the corner of that chart. So these things you're seeing on the sectional, the same things we have in this box. I just have them pulled out here so we could look at them side by side while we're, while we're talking about it. Um, Let's start with a, so we'll go actually to the airport. I did a lot of my private pilot training, which is uh, Sawyer County. This is in Hayward, Wisconsin. We'll look at this one first and then we'll flip over to K, K uh, what was that? Kilo Alpha X-Ray November. Uh, we can look at that one. Um, and let's talk about what we're actually gonna look for on these charts. So we already talked a bit about the airport data, so we don't need to spend more time on this and we'll cover it more again tomorrow when we talk about going to non-towered airports. Um, so we won't look at this box much. There's a ton of other information about, for instance, navigation points. So this is, uh, we'll look for some of these actually, um, but there's information about like um, agency areas and different boundaries, lots of good stuff on here that's, that's worth reading. Um, but today let's start in the top left with airports. So I mentioned that the uh, blue airports are control towers and magenta airports are non-control, uh, do not have control towers. So if we look at uh, Hayward Airport, or Sawyer County, sure enough, it's magenta and there's no control tower and it, there isn't a control tower there. So the other thing we can see here is because it's this circle with a line through it, that means it's a hard surface runway of between 15,000 feet and 8,000 feet in length. So sure enough, we know how to read the airport information. So the smallest runway here is 5,000 feet. 
And so, or the largest one, excuse me, is 5,000 feet. So it's between those two. And so we get uh, that kind of information. If we look at a bigger airport, um, for instance, up at Duluth, then we have a different situation where the hard surface runway is greater than 8,000 feet. And at Duluth, it's 10,600 feet. Um, and so then it's plotted with the actual runway shown like that. The approximate runway uh, uh, orientation is shown on there. So this is actually the alignment of the runway is like that. Uh, shoot some reading your message now. Perfect. Yep. Great suggestion. Yeah. That uh, very high frequency, omnidirectional range, minimal operational network. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting topic, especially for IFR flights. Um, okay. A couple other things to know about. Open dot within a hard surface runway indicates approximate VOR. So that's what shoots uh, has been mentioned as VOR, uh, very high frequency, omnidirectional range. It's a navigation aid. A VRR DME, a DME, or a Vortec location. Um, don't worry about these too much. We'll talk about that more with cross country. But if they exist at the airport, they are shown on the chart as kind of an open circle, like here. Um, interestingly, if we go Sawyer County, so on the chart, it says that Sawyer County has a VOR, right? But if we go in here and actually look at the NOTAMs, so this is the notices to air missions. Uh, you can see, uh, oops, wait a minute. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. I think that they have updated this since I was there. Um, well, what I was going to show is that it used to be that the VOR was being decommissioned, and so it still showed up on all of the charts, which take longer to all update through. Um, but the navigational aid was no tammed as out of commission um, or uh, unserviceable, and so that would mean that you shouldn't expect to be able to use it. Um, but I don't see that marked anymore, so not as useful an example. At any rate, but that's telling us that there is a, a nav aid located at that point in the airport. Um, it looks like it's a distance measuring equipment. I'd have to I'd have to look at the latest um, chart supplement for this to figure out exactly what it is. Uh, you know what? Actually, we can do that. So if we go to that chart supplement, we can look at Sawyer County. So let's see what it's telling us. Information about the runway, the fuel available. Radio aids to navigation. Ah, okay, so sure enough. So we were talking about a VOR, that's a uh, nav aid that, um, it's a nav aid that you can use to figure out what direction on a compass rows you are from the nav aid. So essentially you can figure out where you are from zero degrees magnetic all the way through 360 degrees magnetic on each um, point of the compass rows all the way around. A DME is a distance measuring equipment. That just tells you your distance from the nav aid, but not which direction uh, you are relative to that, just your distance. Um, and so if we go back to this map then, what we're seeing on our small dot here is the DME. So that's uh, this guy up on our legend. Um, but then if we look at the Sawyer County NOTAM, it's telling us that the navigation distance measuring equipment, so that DME uh, just under the older section, uh, is not monitored, monitoring, or monitored, and that it's uh, uh, expected to expire. So that's essentially telling us that it probably won't work when we get there. Uh, okay, so I spent a little bit longer on that than I meant to, but that's okay. Uh, there's some additional uh, airport information. Um, the fuel availability tick marks, so they have these um, kind of almost a, a tick on four sides of it, that indicates that there's fuel available. So if we look at Sawyer County, sure enough, there's fuel available here. Uh, Cable Union, just to the north, also has fuel available. But if we look at, um, for instance, this private runway, there's no fuel. Um, or we can pull up, for instance, Shell Lake, also no fuel. Okay, so they don't have that, uh, those four tick marks. 
Without the tick marks, that means no fuel. Okay. Next one here is this rotating airport beacon in operation between sunrise and sunset to sunrise. So what that means is if you see this star, that means that there is a rotating beacon that will essentially like a, a kind of lighthouse for aircraft um, that you can use to figure out uh, where the airport is. So when we do our night navigation, we'll use those beacons a lot, but you can see, for instance, Cable Union has a beacon, Sawyer County has a beacon. Um, Shell Lake, although it doesn't have fuel, does have a beacon and a couple other things like that. Um, you can see most of these ones all have uh, beacons in and around. There's a couple ones where if it's a bigger airport like um, uh, this one here, the beacon is then shown, uh, I believe it's where it is on the airport. So if you go back to Duluth, big runway, so it's shown with a different indication, but we have that uh, airport beacon again. Okay. Uh, objectionable is sort of interesting, uh, just a notation that like, you might not really want to land here, like maybe in an emergency, but um, but generally we don't think it's okay. Uh, there's one other thing to know about, which is these private non-public airports that may have emergency value. So if there's an airport that's used by a private company, um, and there's quite a few, depending on what part of the country you're looking at, like right in here, there's you know, four private airports. Um, you're not allowed to use them, but they're still charted and they still have some information like the uh, altitude and the or the elevation, excuse me, and the length of the, of the longest runway. Um, and that's just in case in an emergency you needed to land there. So extra emergency information. Okay, so that gives us a little bit on uh, airports. Some more things in here that are really good to read, but that'll get us through at least the first bit here. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is airspace. But before we get into airspace, let's look at another airport and see what we can glean about it. So, and remember inside this information box, there's a ton more information like what kind of, right, the precise elevation, the runway lengths, uh, CTAF, ASOS, all that kind of stuff. Um, but just looking at the icons, we can get a lot of information at a glance. So let's go look at um, KAXN, Alexandria, hey, nice. Oh, Alexandria. Um, this is sort of a fun fact. My long cross country was actually from uh, Sawyer up to uh, Cloquette over here down to St. Cloud and then over. So anyway, that's where I did my long cross country was like that. Um, so I, I grew up in and around this area. Um, Okay, so, oops, I lost my airport though. All right, so just looking at the information that we have plotted here, one thing that we know is there's two runways. They're more or less at a 90 degree angle, although they're uh, 45 degrees off from northwest, uh, north, south, east, west. So um, that's nice though if we had a lot of different types of uh, wind direction, we'd have options with the crossing runways. That's good. Um, we know that it is a hard surface runway between 15,000 feet and 8,000 feet, just looking at the circle that we have here. And sure enough, if we check, we can see that it's a 5,100 foot runway. Okay, so that's useful information. It has a rotating beacon. So if you're flying around at night, we should see that beacon. Um, this would be another one of those things that you want to check the NOTAMs because the beacon may be uh, out of service in the window that you're trying to use it. So Again, a reason why we check the NOTAMs along the flights that we're going to take. Uh, we see that it has these uh, tick marks indicating fuel. So that means there's fuel available. And what else do we see? Oh, this is a good example for a couple of airspace things too. So we'll talk more about that uh, in a second. Um, okay, so let's do one more. Let's go back to Palo Alto and then we're going to look at... Um, Uh, let's talk about obstacles then, obstructions next, and miscellaneous, and then we'll go for airspace with our last bit of time. So uh, we already talked a lot about Palo Alto, but um, just to cover the last kind of bits here. So a lot of this information is inside of the, uh, oops, there's a difference between the sectional and the 
TAC, um, terminal area chart. But uh, okay, so we have a single runway. We know that it's, um, oh, one thing to point out, the sectional, if I can flip back here, notice the sectional here has that um, filled in circle notation. If we switch to the terminal area chart, it changes the length of runway um, requirement. So it'll show shorter runways um, shown this way instead of having them as kind of the open circle. Um, I can't remember the specific amount, but I think it's 1,500 or more gets shown then as the specific location of the runway. So that's one big difference between the terminal area chart and the sectional chart, something to be aware of. Uh, but we also see that it has a rotating beacon. Um, the terminal area chart does not, show, for runways like this, does not show the fuel ticks, but sure enough, if we look at the sectional, it does have fuel ticks. So we know there's fuel ticks there, um, fuel available there. Uh, okay, great. So. I think we've uh, sufficiently um, beat that topic into the ground. Um, we'll talk about communication boxes when we do our navigation as well as radio aids. Let's look at some obstructions. So when you're flying around, you want to be aware of whatever might be in your airspace or might be problematic for you uh, flying, especially low altitudes, but even in general for emergencies. And so if we look at um, we can start out in Sawyer County as a couple of examples here. So one thing we see in Sawyer County is this indication. So that's telling us that there is a obstruction above 200 feet and below 1,000 feet, um, unless it's in an urban area, in which case it's a slightly different number. Uh, and that's what that, that little indication is. If it's like this, that means that there's, oh, and one other thing to point out is the Numbers all mean something. So the elevation of the top above mean sea level is this top number. The elevation, the height above the ground then is the next number. So this is a 469 foot obstacle and the uh, elevation mean sea level is 1,654 feet. So if you were, for instance, flying out of Sawyer County, so you depart the airport, it's 1,216 feet. And if you stayed right around there, so like maybe you're flying at 1,400 feet, really close to the ground, way closer than you, uh, well, than you legally can be, but really than you should be, um, then you would potentially run into this. So that's that's sort of why the, the two different numbers. There's the height so that you have a reference, and then also the uh, elevation so you can check your altimeter. Uh, there's another in, uh, icon here. So this one is saying that we have um, a group of obstructions as well as the information for the, again, uh, elevation and then the height above ground. Um, let's go back to Alexandria. So Alexandria has another icon over here. There's this one right here. And so that means that there is an obstruction with high intensity lights. Those lights may only be operated part time though. So there'll be some sort of like blinking light or, um, or other thing that's going on uh, makes it more visible at night. Um, groups of obstructions, some other things around that area. And then here's one more. So in this case, we have an indication that it has the high intensity obstruction lights, but it's also a thousand feet or higher AGL. And sure enough, the uh, height above ground is 1,189 for this obstacle. So that's pretty tall. I actually did my CFI training out of um, South St. Paul Airport. So that's this guy right here. And something that surprised me about this area for flying is you have these shore view antennas. So let's look at what this is. So we know that it's a group obstruction. So there's multiple and sure enough, I think there's two or three in that area. We know that they're a thousand feet or above AGL. So 1,400, um, so real, real tall. Um, but then there's also this little flag on it. And the reason that there's a flag is, um, I'll finish this thought and I just saw shoot sentiment message. Um, so the reason there's this flag is that it can give it a name for communicating with ATC, either talking to the tower or someone else. Um, uh, and sometimes if it has this VP, then that'll allow you to type it into a GPS database and you could actually go and find it. So this one does not have a VP, but it does have a name, the Shoreview Antennas. And so like if you're coming in and you want to cross through downtown St. Paul's airspace, you might say, I am, you know, uh, four miles to the east of Shoreview Antennas, like to transition. 
you know, there's a bunch of these actually, there's a 3M building, the Capitol, and, and a lot of these different named points are useful to, to know where they are. Stadiums are also marked, uh, especially because they might have a temporary flight restriction. Um, if there's a certain number of people gathered in one area, you're not allowed to fly in that area. So that's what that temporary flight restriction is. Um, and we'll see a couple more flags and we'll see some with VPs on them too, so we can go mark that. All right, shoot some reading your message. All right, BRO. Brownsville? Oh, there's a lot going on here. Cool. They have an active TFR there or anything? Um, all right, so talked about obstructions. You also see wind farms depending on the type or the area of the country you're looking at. So if we go back to California, actually, we do have a couple of places we see collections of wind farm. Um, our cross country flight will likely be out to Byron or Tracy, um, and on the way, then we cross over these these wind farms. Um, so that's another one to know, and they have information about. Uh, the altitude of, of those. Uh, there's also some topographic information if there's um, electrical wires or uh, mountain passes or uh, lookout towers and things like that. Again, useful for navigation or for uh, like awareness. If you're planning on doing maneuvers, you might not want to be doing them right over power lines, um, depending on how tall they are. Here's a good example of a VP that has a, a number on here. So this is Altamont Pass. So let's actually hop back to the airport. And we're going to go a little over time today. Um, so just a heads up for uh, folks. I'll try and keep it to close to an hour. Um, or I'm sorry, close to 1 o'clock. But, um, but I think getting into airspace is going to take a little bit longer than that. So let me flip over to the flight sim scene. So I mentioned that the advantage of a VP point is... Um, we can plug it into our database. It's in, in a known place. This is Altamont Pass. And so, you know, there we are flying from Palo Alto to Altamont Pass. So if I go in here and say, I would like to do a flight plan and I forgot this thing's all wonky. Okay, so let's see if we can get it to go. Uh, we'll start at um, Palo Alto. So let's go Kilo. Papa Alpha, and you'll notice that as I go through, it skips over letters that uh, don't have airports or identifiers for them. So there's uh, uh, Palo Alto Airport. And if I go in here and start typing in, I hope I didn't break that. Okay, good. Okay, so I don't know why it's starting to here, but now I can go for VP. So there's, uh, oops, V. E. A. L, and I can zoom in here so you can see which one I'm typing in. All right, there we go. So VP ALT. And then if we go back to our map page, uh, love this. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, and then if we zoom out, you can see, sure enough, that our route is now plotted to that VP ALT. So this is one of those ones that's really helpful if you are flying around a particular area and you want to just plot things around. Often the VP points are kind of interesting places to see anyway in Microsoft Flight Sim. Um, 
maybe interesting uh, landmarks on the ground. And so often I'll build a flight plan like that and then you can fly it around. Um, and you should be able to use the map feature up here too. Um, so if you wanted to do that navigation, oops, I assumed it would, yeah, okay, there you go. So there you go, now it's showing you that same thing. Okay, back to our airspace discussion. Okay, so there's a whole section on airspace here. Let's talk a little bit about what the different airspaces are, and then we'll see how they're, uh, they're plotted on the um, charts. So first of all, oh, we also looked at the chart supplement several times, but this is another place to get a lot of the same kind of information um, about runway distances and uh, facilities available and things like that. So we're going to talk about the types of airspaces, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Golf. Talk about the weather minimums for each of those. This is a rough way to look at that. And there's a couple of different memory aids I'll suggest. Cruising altitudes for, altitudes for cruise flight, excuse me, and then minimum safe altitudes. So first, the National Airspace System. The US uses class Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, and Golf airspace listed from most to least restrictive. So class Alpha is the most restrictive and Golf is the least. All except class Golf are controlled airspace. Class Delta airspace may revert to class Echo or class Golf when the tower is closed. So this is important for Palo Alto, which is an example of an airport that reverts um, when the tower is closed. So at night it becomes a different class. And you can find out what class it becomes in the chart supplement. So a little bit of uh, overview on airspaces. All the airspaces uh, in all airspace in the U.S. is classified depending on its uses. These classes carry with them certain restrictions, including things like the equipment required to be there uh, or the minimum weathered allowed for VFR flight. So of course, this is really important for uh, you as a soon-to-be solo student pilot because you are going to be flying in these airspaces um, and very specific airspaces, uh, at least when you first get started. And so you need to know what the requirements to be in those airspaces are, and then also how to identify them on the chart. Each airspace has a different purpose and uh, definition of its size and shape. The AIM chapter three has a lot of good details on this. Um, I'll point out a couple of things to know. Uh, class Alpha is this uh, IFR only airspace above 1,800 MSL. So as a uh, private pilot, you wouldn't be flying up here until you get your instrument rating. Um, the class Bravo surrounds major airports. So for instance, around SFO, we have um, these, uh, I won't show the lines just yet, but essentially this kind of like upside down uh, wedding cake they often describe it as. And that just is the, that's the shelves for allowing big airplanes to come in and descend to land. Um, it's protection for you. It's protection for the aircraft coming into land. It's also about uh, wake turbulence concerns and things like that. So it takes into account a lot of um, safety aspects to, to make that work. Class Charlie is around towered airports, but uh, smaller airports, not quite as big as the Class Bravo. So an example of that would be uh, San Jose. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna switch to the more clean view here and we can start to look at these. So here's all of our airports here. And now I can turn on the airspaces. So. That's a really busy airspace. Let's find a little bit easier one. So here is uh, Minneapolis is a, a pretty nice clean one. So if you look at the airspace here for Minneapolis, it's got this circle shape and that's these tiers of, of a wedding cake sort of thing. So each of these goes up to a certain altitude and you can see the innermost tier goes all the way to the ground. The next one here then goes to 2,300. Uh, and up to 10,000, the next one starts at 3,000, and up and up and up. So it's this upside down kind of wedding cake thing. Class Charlie airspace will have that same sort of upside down wedding cake sort of shape. So again, it's to the ground here, and then uh, starts at 16,000, at least for this airport. In this section, that's what we're seeing here. Class Delta does not have those sort of tiers. It's just a, a circle around. Um, so for instance, here's one, goes from ground to 2,700. We'll talk about how to see this on a standard chart in just a second, but that's what that is. Um, and those are all around towered airports. Beyond that, then we have our class Echo, that's controlled airspace um, above a certain altitude AGL, and we'll talk about how class Golf is defined. Um, but for the most part, we're flying in class Echo when we're flying around in the United States. 
The exceptions would be class golf, and class golf is essentially defined as any place where there isn't uh, controlled airspace, so it sort of fills in the gaps. Um, there's a couple of heights that are good to memorize. We won't necessarily get into them right. Well, we have to talk a little bit about it, but the default height for class golf um, goes from the ground all the way up to 14,500. There are very few places in the country where that's the case anymore. Almost always class golf ends at 1,200, and that's where class echo starts. Um, but there are a couple of places still where you see this. Class uh, Echo either starts at uh, 1,200 or at 700 feet AGL, depending on the specific definition of the airspace. And we'll see in the charts how to identify that. So it's either going to start uh, 1,200 feet above the ground or 700 feet above the ground, uh, really close to the ground. Or in some cases, Echo goes all the way to the ground. Um, and we'll look at an example of that too. Again, the reason this is really important is that the minimum weather and the equipment you need in those different airspaces change. So if you're going to fly in the class Bravo airspace, you have different weather requirements than in class Charlie and then class Delta and on and on. Class Golf being the least restrictive. Okay, so this is from the PHAC chapter 15. Categories and types of airspaces are dictated by the complexity or density of aircraft movements, nature of operations conducted within the airspace, and level of safety required, and national and public interest. There's controlled airspace, generic term that covers anything in which air traffic control service is provided in accordance with airspace classification. So notice that I said most of the country is 1,200 feet AGL is the end of Gulf. So that means that ECHO, everything alpha through ECHO, is controlled airspace. That means that ATC provides separation services there. Um, and so that's quite a bit of the country. ATC is, is controlled airspace for, for most of the airspace of the country. Uncontrolled airspace is just not designated alpha through echo. ATC has no authority or responsibility to control traffic here, um, but, but there are still VFR weather minimums. So just because it's uncontrolled doesn't mean it's lawless. It still has minimums you have to maintain for VFR flight, um, but it doesn't have ATC authority or responsibility. That same note, some class Delta airports revert to Echo or Gulf. A couple of special use airspaces to be aware of, those prohibited areas. So this is a flight there is completely prohibited. We'll look at this on, a, on the chart as well. Um, this means you can't fly in there at all. Um, and if you do, then you'll probably have jets scrambled to come and pull you out. Um, so that would be, for instance, the White House, uh, or I think it's the National Mall technically, but the White House. Um, Restricted areas, they're not prohibited, but they have certain restrictions to them. Um, so, you know, without permission, for instance, or if you're not following certain guidelines, um, it depends a little bit on what the restricted area is. You can look it up on the sectional. There's warning areas. They're similar to restricted areas, but they're outside of the U.S. jurisdiction. So this would be like over the water. There's military operating areas, MOAs. We see these a lot in California. And again, we'll look at what these are. And um, these are areas where there's a lot of military activity going on. Although you can fly through them as a VFR pilot if you'd like to, you should be aware that they might have fast flying aircraft um, and you might just be putting yourself in a very busy area if the MO is active. So you're allowed to be in there, but it may not be a smart idea. Um, you know, so I typically fly around MOAs unless one, if I know they're cold, if there's no one there, then I'll go through them because it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, if they're hot, I typically go around them because I don't want to deal with fast, fast flying jets around me. Um, although you are allowed to be there. Alert areas use high caution for high volume of pilot training or unusual aerial activities. Uh, there's some of these up in like northern uh, Michigan, I believe, um, where it's like they just have certain military bases that really focus on training for certain maneuvers, uh, a lot of pilot training. And the last one here is controlled firing areas. They aren't charted, so we won't see these on our sectional chart, but they're areas uh, where there's going to be uh, missile firing or other kinds of uh, projectiles like that. Um, but they have spotters to suspend activities when there's aircraft in the vicinity. So we don't have to worry about them. They just stop their activities when we're there. There's also a lot of other airspace, airspaces that exist. For instance, near Livermore, there's that research lab that we saw when we were doing ground reference maneuvers. Um, so you want to check before you fly and make sure you understand the airspace that you're, you're flying in. Um, we've actually dealt already with quite a few different airspaces that kind of fall in this category. For instance, when we were doing spin training over uh, Año Nuevo, there's a, uh, a restrict, it's not a restrictor, it's a, it's a other airspace um, 
near the surface along the coast to protect wildlife. And so that's another one that you, you'd see that on the chart and you wanna make sure you understand what it means. All right, so we're gonna circle back and look at all of these on the charts, but let's finish up the requirements to talk about those and then we can spend a moment looking at the actual charts themselves. If you would like to fly in class alpha, remember class alpha is that uh, IFR only 8,000 feet MSL and up to flight level 6, 000, uh, 600, um, so 60,000 feet above ground, essentially. Um, I'm sorry, above uh, sea level MSL. Uh, in order to fly in that class alpha, you need an ATC clearance. You need to be IFR equipped and you have to have an instrument rating. So that's why I said as private pilots without an instrument rating, this doesn't apply to us. But you need to know where it starts because you can't go in there. Class Bravo, you need an ATC clearance to get in. You need to have two-way radio, transponder, and an altitude reporting capability. So uh, transponder, sorry, transponder with altitude reporting capability. The minimum pilot shift is a private pilot, so that's what you would have at the end of uh, these lessons. Um, but a student or recreational pilot may operate with additional uh, certification and Oh, if seeking uh, private pilot certification and if you meet some regulatory requirements. So mention here is this two-way radio. That one is maybe a little more straightforward. This transponder with altitude reporting capability, let's look at what that means. So the aircraft has in it this little um, device, which if you remember, we do lights, camera, action before we take the runway. When we say camera, I always point to this thing, and that's the transponder. And I also always make sure it's set in altitude reporting mode. It says ALT here. So this is our way of um, identifying this aircraft as a specific aircraft with a particular code. So if I wanted to fly in a class Bravo airspace, they're gonna say something like, uh, oops, let me switch it to this. So you can see what I'm seeing. Um, they're gonna say something like, uh, you can fly in the class Bravo, in less words, obviously, but you can find the crest Bobo, but in order to do so, you have to squawk three, five, two, six, or something like that. So that would be with this um, transponder with altitude reporting capabilities. And then they would verify that they can see us with that specific code. When it's set to one, two, zero, zero, that is a code that just means I'm a VFR pilot flying VFR, and it, it doesn't identify you uniquely per se. Uh, it's still associated with your aircraft, but. Um, but it just says that I'm flying VFR following visual flight rules. When you are around major airports, you are often within what's called the um, mode C veil, which is uh, essentially an area where you're required to have a transponder, even if you're not uh, in those, um, in an airspace that requires a transponder normally. So you see this mode C 30 nautical miles. So that's 30 nautical miles around SFO. Anywhere you're flying in here, you have to have a mode C transponder with altitude reporting. So um, something to keep in mind. Actually, I should put mode C in this. Um, make a little note. Oops. OK. Class C then, the Class Charlie. So we talked about Class Bravo would be like if you want to fly around SFO. Class Charlie would be maybe San Jose or if you want to fly around uh, Oakland. These are both Class Charlie. Um, the requirements for Class Charlie is you have to have two-way radio communications prior to entry. So to contrast that with ATC clearance, in order to fly into a Class Bravo, they need to say you are cleared into the Class Bravo, and you need to say back that you are cleared into the Class Bravo. So they need to explicitly clear you to enter. If you don't explicitly get cleared to enter, you can't enter the Bravo. In contrast, Class Charlie and Class Delta, you need to have established two-way radio communications. Establishing two-way radio communications just means that ATC has said your end number back to you. So in the case of our aircraft, we're flying Cessna, Alpha, Lima, Tango, India, Sierra. We need to hear back from the tower, Alpha, Lima, Tango, India, Sierra, to establish that two-way radio communications. If they didn't want us to come into their airspace, they may say something like calling aircraft standby or um, calling aircraft uh, you know, circle or something like that. In other words, they wouldn't identify us by name so as to make sure that we aren't allowed to fly into their airspace if they wanted to keep us out for some reason. But as soon as they say our 
N number, then we have established two-way radio communications and we can technically enter the airspace uh, if we want. We also have to follow their instructions. So if they establish two-way radio communications, then say circle and don't enter our airspace, then we'd have to do that. But, um, but as far as ability to enter, all we need to hear is our N number back. For class Charlie, we need two-way radio and transponder with altitude reporting. And then there's no specific minimum pilot certificate to do this. So a student pilot can land in class Charlie. Class Delta, same sort of uh, initial requirements. You only need a two-way radio. You don't technically need a, a transponder with altitude reporting. Depending on where you're flying, they may expect it, but it's not required. Um, I did my night cross-country flight to Duluth from Hayward, Wisconsin, and Duluth is a class uh, Delta airport, but it's a pretty big class Delta airport. So if we go up here, you can see, uh, there it is. And so when I showed up, they were kind of expecting I had a, a transponder because most aircraft do. The aircraft I was flying didn't. I wasn't required to for any reason. And so when I showed up, um, they said, hey, can you squawk this? Or like, we aren't seeing you. And so I said, um, you know, unable negative transponder. Um, and that's fine. You don't need it to enter class Delta. Class Echo, um, again, this is now the rest of the airspace besides Gulf, not for a specific towered uh, airport. There's no entry requirements for VFR. There's no specific equipment, no minimum pilot certificate. Um, above certain altitudes, you do need equipment. So asterisk to this that um, that's not totally true. Um, they have a little note here about ADS-B out being required. So there's the 91.225 to look at. Uh, but in general, you don't really need much to go in here. And then class golf, you need nothing. All right, last but not least, actually let's to let's look at the, the charts real quick. So we'll hop back to charts, touch back on all those airspace things that we were just looking at. So I'll turn all that off and I will have this up so you can reference it. And let's run through some of these different airspaces. So if I turn back on our VFR chart, um, we'll start out here, keep it a little simpler. So if we look back at our Sawyer County Airport, we see, uh, oops, actually, I want this. I'm going to open this up. Oops. Okay, so uh, we'll, let's just start at the top and look at each of these as we go. So we have our class Bravo airspace. So if we zoom in, here's Minneapolis, a big airport, and these thick blue lines are our class Bravo. If we look, uh, where does it say? Oh, I'm expecting them to have this. It's probably somewhere else I'm not seeing right now, but um, you can see the beginning, uh, the bottom and the top of that particular shelf based on this. So this is saying it goes from a surface to 10,000 feet MSL. At this next ring, it goes from uh, 2,300 uh, MSL to 10,000 MSL, and then 10,000 to, I'm sorry, 3,000 to 10,000. So this is the bottom of the shelf in there. And so then that's how you get that upside down wedding cake where this part goes to the ground. This is one shelf a little higher, a little higher. Uh, but the top of all of them is, is at 10,000 each time. Okay, so that's the class Bravo. Notice that this area also has this mode C transponder here. So there's that mode C veil we talked about, same thing as SFO. Okay, next one down here is the class Charlie airspace. Let's go find some class Charlie airspace. So if we go down to Fresno, this is a good class Charlie. Same sort of thing. We have our from the surface to 4,400, and then our next shelf here is from 16,000 MSL to 44,000 MSL. Um, you can see there's kind of a weird cutout in the shelf. Sometimes they'll do that. Um, so you need to be aware of what the specific airspace looks like. And this shelf starts at 2,500, so 4,000. There's our Charlie class Delta airspace. So we can zoom in on, uh, let's look at a nice clean Delta. This is fine. Um, so here is one for uh, Limor. And you can see this number. So this is the ceiling of the class Delta airspace in hundreds of feet. Uh, and if it has a minus, that indicates that it's up to, but not including. So in the case of Salinas, for instance, it's up to 2,500, but not including 2,500. 
Okay, and that's if you look at um, the class Charlie airspace for Monterey, just to the the west here, you can see why they have it up to, but not including 2,500 is for this overlapping bit. All right, class E that goes to the surface. So if you remember, we were looking at our national airspace and we said that sometimes class E will go all the way down to the surface. So if we go back here, we can see that charted with a dashed line. So a Merced, for instance, this is our E to the surface cut out by a delta here. And so this is all class echo all the way down to the surface. Uh, if we go back to our, oops, our Alexandria one, we see that Alexandria is that same way. So they have class echo all the way down to the surface. And interesting, they have this little cutout key thing. And that's pretty common for an instrument approach that comes in. So I'm going to guess that there's an instrument approach that, that comes in this way for IFR flight. Um, and that's because ATC would want to control the traffic all the way down to the runway for this approach. Next one here is this class echo airspace with floor uh, 700 feet above surface that laterally abuts class golf airspace. Has an ILS. Shoot says has an ILS. Yep. Okay. Sounds right. Um, so... Uh, okay, these two are kind of hard to read, but essentially what it's saying is that if it abuts a class golf airspace, I'll have this notation here, most of the time in the US it abuts a 12,000 foot or higher airspace, which is this blue one. So these three are some of the most annoying in my mind of how they're they're annotated. So let me let me start with the blue one first. There's actually an example of this out in Texas. It's one of the few ones that remains. So you notice this blue uh, vignette. And what this is saying is that the side that's lighter, so going this direction, all of the stuff here, class echo, starts at 1,200 1, feet. Okay, so if we look at this, that's this kind of section here, right? It, most of the country has this thing where it starts at 1,200 feet. And that's because it's on the other side of the blue and essentially what they have for this is like, you see the vignette here because on the other side, we'll talk about in a second, um, is sort of interesting and unique, but the reality is like, this vignette is saying that everything on this part of the country, you know, like a ridiculously large area is 1,200 feet AGL. So it's like, besides this tiny bit, everything else echo starts at 1,200 AGL. Um, there are a couple of other exceptions. There's ones up in, um, uh, I know there's some in, I think it's Minnesota area that I can find it really quick. Um, but anyway, there's a couple more like at certain borders and stuff like that, some in Alaska. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, our class echo starts at 1,200 because it's on the other side, this side of this vignette. But on this side of this vignette, this little area, class echo actually starts at 14,500 MSL. So that's one of the couple of examples where it's all the way up here. Okay, so that's why we rarely see this top one where it has this class G written is because like usually what it's laterally abutting is a 1,200 foot zone. So, right, if we look at, if we know all of this is 1,200 feet uh, is where class echo starts, then inside of this vignette, Class echo starts at 700 feet AGL. So that's what this one is saying, is that when it laterally abuts right here, this 1,200 feet, um, then it's going to be, uh, use this notation, this kind of vignette, and then the inside of the vignette is 700 feet. And that's often also for instrument approaches. So if we go back to Alexandria, you can see that same sort of thing. So we have, not only do we have class echo down to the ground, but we also have this vignette that says that out here, class echo goes to 700 feet. Okay. And it's pretty common you see those all over. In the Bay Area, for instance, like the outside of this vignette is all of this. So it's like basically the entire Bay. This is all class echo 700. Um, in cases where it's not to the surface for some other airspace, it's like uh, mostly it's all 700 feet.
Okay, so we covered, let me make sure we touched on all the airspaces, about five minutes over and we got a little bit more to go, probably, I'm gonna say 10 minutes. Um, it's not a ton, just a little bit. Um, so we talked about class A, uh, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, and the difference between 1,200 and 700 feet AGL. Um, we looked at a couple of ones where it goes to the floor. A couple of these I'll just quickly point out so you can see what they look like. So I mentioned that in uh, California, there's a lot of this MOA area. So this is what a MOA looks like. Um, so these are like four or five MOAs altogether. Um, this sort of like, like that's one MOA here, for instance. Um, and you see these all over the country. There's a restricted area in the center of the MOA. So we talked about restricted areas. Not that you can't fly in there, but that you have to follow whatever the restrictions are. Um, and uh, they'll usually include kind of how you would get uh, approved to fly in there or what you need to do. And usually it's like contact the controlling agency. Uh, we talked about warning areas. So remember warning areas, the US doesn't have a sole jurisdiction like over the ocean. Uh, but it essentially is similar to a restricted area. So there's a warning area. Um, alert areas. I'll see if I can find one really quick. I think there's some up here. Maybe not. All right, that's all right. Controlled firing areas like we talked about are not plotted. Uh, and then one just to, to call out, because or two, two that are useful to know, there's also this... Um, Flight operations below 1,000 feet uh, are in violation of NOAA restrictions. So you can't go below 1,000 feet in this area. That's what this dotted thing means. Um, this is a good example of like, understand what you're seeing in the charts for where you're gonna fly. Another one over here is um, this circle. For reasons of national security, pilots are requested to avoid flight at or below 1,000 feet, or I'm sorry, 800 feet AGL in this area. Um, so that's specifically where this research lab is. Um, okay. I think that's it for airspace and looking at the charts for airspace. So if you're looking at the SFO terminal area chart and going like, this is a lot to process, um, totally agree. There's a lot going on. Just take it one bit at a time and just look at, for instance, maybe start with, okay, what's going on around Palo Alto? So we have a Delta that's cut into another Delta that's cut into a Charlie. Okay, so that's a couple of things, but we can start with just Palo Alto. So we know this side means it goes up to, but not including 1,500. On this side, it's up to 2,000. And then we know there's a train bridge that we can use for VFR navigation. There's an, a Dumbarton bridge we can use for VFR navigation. Those are the two flags here. We know that the runway and we know about the uh, beacon. We know there's Stanford Stadium here. They may tell us to do something with Stanford Stadium. Often they'll have a circle Stanford Stadium if they need to, to hold us for a little bit. There's another VP point. This is a different style that we didn't really talk about, but there's another one here we can plug into the database. We know we have obstructions here, um, obstructions here. So um, just take it step by step and, and it'll be all right. Okay. Let's talk about VFR weather minimums. So in order to fly in each of those different airspaces, there's a certain minimum weather we have to have in order to fly VFR in those areas. So visual flight rules means we have to be able to uh, see visually. And really these are about protecting VFR aircraft from IFR aircraft. So people who are flying on instruments can fly in the clouds. And if you're flying out of the clouds, but you're flying right next to a cloud and someone is IFR and pops out of that cloud, you have to have enough time to do something so these minimum VFR requirements are to make sure that there's a safe separation between that IFR traffic and us. We'll also talk about altitudes we fly at, which also helps with that sort of thing. So um, this is all in FAR uh, 91.155. They have a table form in there that I'll pull up real quick. There's a couple of other memory devices that people use for this. I tend to prefer the pyramid. I think that that's, uh, it clicks better with how my brain thinks about these things, but there's nothing wrong with the other ones. So here's the way that the FARs chart it. You can see, for instance, class A airspace is not applicable because we don't fly VFR there. Class Bravo, you need to have three statute miles of visibility. So that's like forward visibility and like haze. And you stay clear of clouds. Class Charlie, Delta, and Echo, when you're less than 10,000 feet, are all three statute miles of visibility and 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and 2,000 feet horizontally. You'll often hear that 
for a memory device as three 152s, like a Cessna 152. So we'll say three 152s for most of these because it's three statute mile visibility and then uh, 1,000 feet above, 500 feet below, 2,000 feet horizontally. Uh, and then there's weather requirements for helicopters, for golf, day, night. You can see why the table is kind of obnoxious. So let me pull up an, uh, a couple other ways to remember this. One is just a list form. So if, oops, come on. Uh, if this works better for you, I think that's just great. So this is essentially saying that everything follows the 3152 rule with five exceptions. Bravo, three miles clear of clouds. Above 10,000 feet, it's five statute miles of visibility and 1,000 feet above, 1,000 feet below, and a mile uh, horizontally. Class Golf, uh, surface to 1,200 AGL is one mile clear of clouds. This is right near the surface. Class Golf, uh, beyond that, one 152 instead of three 152. And then at night, you can be within one half mile of center line with your one mile of clear clouds. And this is essentially so you could go out and do laps in the pattern if you wanted with horrible visibility. Um, I, I don't think I would feel comfortable flying in one mile visibility. That's like, yeah, that's that's real rough. Um, but uh, you could legally do it, even if it's a dumb decision. This is the one that I prefer the most. This is uh, something from Ma Rod Machado, and it's a way of remembering based on a pyramid. So essentially, golf at night follows the same rule. It's a three statute miles visibility, 1,000, 500, 2,000, and Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, all follow that same rule below 10,000. So three 152s. There's an asterisk on Bravo, which is that it's just to remain clear of clouds. You don't need that three statute mile. On the Gulf side, it's also that cloud uh, 152, but you only need one statute mile visibility. And when you're below 1,200 feet AGL, it's one mile and clear of clouds. When you're in Echo or Gulf above 10,000, you need 1,000 above, 1,000 below, one mile uh, horizontally, and then five statute miles visibility. And you can imagine that's because aircraft are going to be flying faster at those kinds of altitudes. I think my iPad just died there. Okay, so that's the weather minimums. So when we go out to fly, um, there's a certain amount of weather minimums that we're going to hold for either our own personal minimums or for uh, practical minimums for what we're actually doing that day. For instance, uh, if you're a new student pilot, you're going to have a minimum amount or a maximum amount of crosswind that you're going to want to be flying in, and that's something to talk about with your CFI. Um, but uh, these are the legal weather minimums. This is, you know, you can't, you cannot fly in conditions that are less than that. Um, okay, and the last one on here to talk about before we close out is, oh, I'm sorry, two more things to talk about before we close out. One is the altitudes for cruise flight, and then the minimum safe altitudes um, for maneuvering and flying. Um, increasingly, I think this is a lesson to pull into two lessons. So I'm sorry, this is getting to be quite a bit of information. Um, okay, so do a little refresh, shake it off. Let's talk about VFR altitudes. So this is actually my wife's favorite fun fact from aviation. So you may enjoy it as well. Uh, this is a lot of text. I'm gonna wait to pull that up until we talk about it. So when we fly, uh, in an aircraft, we fly at specific altitudes, kind of like highways, um, in that like you're choosing a specific lane of altitude, so like highways, but you know, vertically into the air, so that you don't have as much conflicting traffic. And so everyone who's heading in one direction is all flying at roughly the same altitude. Everyone heading in the other direction is flying at a different altitude, so we don't have this head-on situation. Um, and then people who are flying VFR are flying at different altitudes than people who are flying IFR instruments. So those minimum or those altitudes for cruise flight, you're expected to use those when you're flying um, more than 3,000 feet above the surface uh, and you're not doing like maneuvering or something like that. So uh, it's cru cruise flight above 3,000 feet. Um, we can look at the specific uh, FAR here is pretty short. Essentially, it comes down to on a magnetic course of zero degrees through 179 degrees, then you need to be odd, and I'm going to give you a mem memory device in a second, so don't worry, um, odd feet, uh, at odd thousand feet MSL plus, 1, or plus 500. And then if your magnetic course is 180 through uh, 359 degrees, then it's even MSL plus 500. So if you're flying to the east, then it's 
odd plus 500 if you're flying to the west it's even plus 500 for vfr flight the memory device that my instructor gave me and i'm sorry for anyone from the east coast listening to this but this was the way that i was taught and i think it's kind of helpful so uh coming from the west coast at least essentially the the takeaway being you know living on the uh, uh i'm sorry um you can remember the VFR flying altitudes because we know people on the East Coast are all a little odd. And so it's odd, 1,000 feet plus 500. And then even plus 500 feet for the West Coast. So got some odd folks on the East Coast. Uh, and so it's odd plus, uh, odd 1,000 plus 500. So an example of this would be if you're flying, uh, you know, a magnetic heading directly east, so 90 degrees, you'd be flying at 5,500. Flying to the west, then it would be like maybe you're flying a magnetic heading of 270, it'd be like 6,500. Right? Um, when we do our cross country planning, we'll talk more about this, but this is something we plan for. So we talked about how much fuel is it going to take to climb to certain altitudes. So this is exactly that kind of decision. So you decide based on the route you're taking, what altitude you need to be flying at, and then also take into account that you should be flying at uh, either odd plus 1,000, or I'm uh, sorry, odd plus 500 or even plus 500, depending on your direction. Okay, last but not least, we have our minimum safe altitudes. So the reason that this is nice to talk about in this lesson is because we spent so much time looking at charts. And one of the things that you saw on those charts is the, um, oh, which my iPad just died. So give that a second to, to charge here. Uh, but the minimum safe altitudes are um, the altitudes you're allowed to fly at by federal uh, regulation. So the, the lowest above the ground you can be. Uh, and so the key quote here, except when necessary for takeoff and landing, no person may operate an aircraft below the following altitudes. So let me get my iPad back online here. We may need to move to plan B. Give this one more try. Hey, there we go. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay, so here is our Minimum altitude, so 91, 119. So the first one on here is, again, that critical sort of overview piece, and that's anywhere, uh, an altitude allowing, uh, if a power unit fails, so if you lose your engine, an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. So if you were complying with everything else in this FAR, um, but you were flying somewhere really silly, this is the kind of thing that they might uh, might still get you on, which is like, you really shouldn't have been flying here because you weren't able to make an emergency landing without undue hazard. Uh, over congested areas is different than over uh, other than congested areas. Over congested areas like a city, a town, or settlement, uh, you need to be an altitude of a thousand feet above the highest obstacle within a horizontal radius of two thousand feet of the aircraft. So you remember we were seeing some of those obstacles charted on the the charts. And so if you're flying around and say, um, like out here, so you know that the uh, altitude of this is 237. And so if you were within uh, a thou or 2,000 feet of it, uh, then you would need to be um, at least uh, 1,000 feet above it. Um, one important call out is this distinction between over congested areas versus over other than congested areas over other than congested 
um, it needs to be an altitude of 500 feet above the surface. So it's 1,000 feet over congested and 500 feet over uncongested. If it's over open water, especially populated areas, then the rule is you cannot be operated closer than 500 feet to any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure. So again, we still have this anywhere clause that we need to be cognizant of, but if you're flying over like a big open lake and there's nothing around, you can technically fly right at the surface if you wanted to. Um, if you lost a power unit, you wouldn't be causing undue hazard to anyone on the surface. Uh, it'd be kind of silly because you wouldn't have any reaction time to solve a problem. Um, so reckless, but not necessarily illegal. Um, so how do you know if it's congested or not a congested area? The definition of congested is uh, nebulous and also um, really leans towards defining it as congested. So one rule of thumb, which I don't necessarily agree with, but you'll hear a lot is these yellow areas on the chart. So like Sacramento has this big yellow block. That's sort of, you can think of as where you would see lights when you're flying at night for identifying a city at night. And so you could say, well, that's a congested area because it's big enough that they've put uh, indications of where the lights are. And so some folks will say flying over this, that's congested and flying over here is not congested. The FAA is more inclined to say that anywhere that there's a lot of people around, which you can kind of say that for a lot of the country, um, is congested. So, you know, definitely over yellow areas is congested, but even flying over, um, you know, some of these routes along the highway down here where you might have, well, there's a different problem going on here. We hooked up the airspace, but, um, but if you were flying over like a highway and there's a lot of people or something, it may be congested because it's a busy day at the on the highway or something like that. So just to be aware that 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 definition is not super clear and, and really leans towards defining things as congested. And there's uh, some information about helicopters and power chutes. So, okay, so that's our minimum altitudes, uh, 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within a horizontal radius of 2,000 feet around the aircraft when it's congested. If it's not congested, 500 feet or 500 feet from any vessel, structure, vehicle, person, if it's sparsely populated or over water. All right, and that's it. Okay, so I know that was a lot. Let's quickly recap everything we talked about. So we went through all the required pre-flight action. We talked about Northwest Craft. It's a good acronym to remember. We're gonna do weather reports tomorrow. Talked about fuel requirements in particular. We looked at the charts. We looked at how to read some of these symbols and went through a handful of them on the actual charts themselves to kind of identify them. Uh, we talked a lot about the national airspace system. We talked about class Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Golf. Alpha is for IFR flight only, um, high up above where we're going to be flying. Bravo, Charlie, Delta are all controlled tower uh, airspaces. Echo is then a controlled airspace without a tower. And Golf is uncontrolled airspace. We have a bunch of weather minimums, which we have a table form, a list form, or pyramid form for memory aid. And these are the minimum required weather in order to fly in a certain area. We have talked about altitudes for cruise flight. So out in the East Coast, they're kind of odd. And so it's odd plus 500. Uh, if you're flying west, then it's even plus 500. And then the minimum safe altitudes for flight. So if it's congested versus not congested. Um, but the most important thing being that if you lost an, an engine, would you be able to make a safe landing without undue hazard to people on the ground, people or property on the ground? Um, but you do also need to know these minimum safe altitudes, like the actual 1,000 feet above congested for 200 feet around the highest obstacle, or 2,000 feet around, excuse me, the, high, the highest obstacle within 2,000 feet around, you need to be 1,000 feet above that. So completion standards, client should be demonstrate knowledge to an appropriate level for solo flight of required pre-flight planning, navigation charts, national airspace systems, weather briefings, and flight plans. This is a key line here. By the time you finish your private pilot, everything we just talked about is going to be part of your final test. But to get to your solo, you don't need to know everything. You just need to know the stuff that's going to be really important around your specific airport. Um, we looked at the differences of some airports around the country. So flying out of Palo Alto, there's more to learn because you have busy airspace right next to you. Um, but in other parts of the country, it's a little less, um, less busy. Required homework, memorize those VFR weather minimums. Memorize the VFR pattern or altitude, excuse me, for cruise flights. And then you want to purchase paper copies of the San Francisco sectional and San Francisco terminal area chart. Uh, paper copies, these are really nice for actually going and looking over. So I'd recommend these for whatever part of the country you're in. Um, they're about, I think they're like maybe 
10 maybe $20 each. Um, so they're not like free, but they're they're not super expensive. Um, and they're really nice to lay out on a table and, and look over. Um, uh, and then recommended homework, read Airspace in the AIM 3, Chapter 3, and then start reading the VFR-related FARs, Part 91. Okay, that's it. Any questions before we close out? And thanks for uh, for sticking around for the longer time today. Apologies that I went over a little bit more than expected. Okay, great. Well, if anything comes up uh, after the fact, always feel free to message in Discord. Otherwise, I will see you tomorrow uh, when we'll be talking about non-towered airport operations. And we will actually go out and fly tomorrow. Um, kind of fun. So, Lots to digest. Thank you. Yep, shoots. I'm, I am definitely going to split this into two lessons uh, in a future, a future situation. So um, yeah. Uh, and we'll do the, the weather briefing tomorrow too. I think it'll be fun. So all right, great. I will see you all tomorrow.